Thank you, Sir Chris. Um, I mean, just the, the comparison is between the Eastern countries and Western Europe. Um, do you think that test and trace can, and isolate can work in Western Europe with the kind of levels we're seeing in Western Europe at the moment, or is it only ever going to be a marginal benefit through the winter? No, I think it can work. It will not provide the whole answer, but it's not just in the Asian countries. Uh, Sweden has been very much in the spotlight and there are very strongly held different views on the approach they've taken. But clearly, the approach has been one in which they've got community engagement and involvement because of the culture of Swedish society. So without wanting to recommend the whole package in Sweden, there's a lot we can learn from how they've achieved that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Aaron. We, we've got a few noises off, as they say in the theatre, so if um, I could ask witnesses and members uh, if they're not speaking to mute their microphones, uh, but not. Uh, Dawn Butler has the next question. Thank you very much, Chair, and I want to thank all the professors for coming in today and giving evidence. I almost feel like I want to apologise to you because you seem to be saying what we've heard time and time again, but it hasn't been acted upon. The test track and trace and isolate system, if we had got it right in the beginning, I think we would have been in a better position now. Um, I think WHO, four days after we stopped mass testing in the UK, gave us a very clear message of test, test, test. Um, my question is, um, we know that clear messaging is vital and important to saving lives, especially in compliance and at the beginning of an epidemic. What could we have learned in the summer lockdown to have helped us with the clear messaging and with the test, trace and isolate system? Sorry, um, that too, to, either of the professors, to either of the professors actually um, who would like to answer. Damon? So just to say, I mean, I think it's incredibly important the level of public trust and also communication with the public and listening to public voices in our Academy of Medical Sciences report on preparing for a challenging winter, we emphasize the importance of really stepping up the testing capability. Very important that people can, uh, when they have symptoms, it's really important they can know whether or not they're infected because it has such a big effect on their lives, whether they can go to work or whether they can't go to work and so on. Um, so I think the point we made was it was really important to have clear and consistent messaging, such as we've seen, as Chris has said, in in, in um, Sweden throughout the pandemic. And that message was very clear in our report, alongside the importance of working particularly with local communities, um, because we know that we have a very diverse community. We need to be working with different languages, different faith groups, different ethnic groups, different communities to get messages across. We know uh, that a lot of people from surveys are quite confused about what they should or shouldn't be doing even if they, if they do wish to comply. And they may not be clear about what, what is meant by self-isolation and what they need to do to um, uh, look after themselves, look after their family and uh, prevent onward transmission. Dawn. Thank you very much. Just one quick question to Professor um, Harrison. Um, what, what message would you like the government now to, to portray going forward? Um, well, in terms of messages to the population as a whole, I think in some of the high risk, high transmission areas, I think we need a very clear set of unambiguous guidance. Because one of the problems over the summer, uh, in terms of the previous question you asked, was that we had multiply escalating uh, control measures in areas of high transmission that were changed with rapid frequency, uh, which contributed to the confusion people felt because they weren't sure at which point in the, the escalating controls they were at. Um, I think in, uh, going into the winter, if we're expecting as we are, high rates in a number of areas, um, I think one of the key messages is that we need a simple set of guidelines for uh, key areas that are going to have for structural, demographic and economic reasons continued high transmission. I think those areas need um, very clear, simple messages of control and I think they need the kind of resources to be allocated both to the local authority to uh, develop the test and trace system on the local level and to support those who are self-isolating because one of the reasons of very low compliance in self-isolation 
is not uh, behavioural disinclination, but actually not being able to afford to do it for many communities. Great. And Professor Hatt, thank you very much. And Professor Ham, I think you wanted to come in. Just to uh, agree with what Dominic has just said and to add, as well as the messages being clear and consistent, it's important to understand who the messengers should be. And I think what we've learned, certainly what I've learned from my work in the NHS and with local government colleagues, is having credible local leaders. They can be elected members of councils, they can be members of faith groups or community groups, they can be respected members of the health and care community, but also having people of different age groups. So we know getting messages to younger people is going to be critically important, and that could be through a variety of channels, but you need to have role models from your communities who are prepared to work with you. This is a collective responsibility led by local government, but embracing all of those assets. And if we can do that well, as we are in some places, we'll be in a great position. Thank you very much, uh, Dawn. We next go to Barbara Keeley, then Carol Monaghan and Neve, uh, Neil Hanvey. Uh, Barbara. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got a couple of questions, mainly for Professor Dominic Harrison. Um, we know that local health protection teams are reaching far higher proportions of contacts than the national system. Uh, so perhaps you could tell us why you think, uh, why you know that, uh, that those teams are performing so much better given that they lack the same scale of resources. We may have touched on some of the ideas already, but are there lessons that we could now be applying across the country uh, that, you, that you've picked up uh, on that? Thanks, yes. Um, Blackburn with Darwin was one of the first local authorities after Leicester to do what's called local contact tracing, although in effect we're not doing local contact tracing, we're at the moment doing local case tracing. So this is following up cases who are confirmed, who the national system hasn't been able to contact to even get their contacts. So we're doing, we've been doing that since the 29th of July. Um, and what we do is we get the cases that the national system hasn't been able to contact for 24 hours. We're then following them up locally and we've had uh, up to the 3rd of November 1,186 cases devolved to us, to the local team, um, and we've got a success rate of 89%. And of course that's 89% of the ones who weren't picking the phone up to the national system. And our uh, experience over the last uh, few months has been that the key reasons why we're getting a higher rate are firstly that um, people appreciate getting contacted by a local telephone number by the local authority. Our first action is to text them saying your council, you know, we your council need to speak to you. Um, they do respond to that. Um, our services are run by people that have worked in neighbourhoods and communities and know the people that they're contacting. They will often know the streets because they'll have worked there. Um, so we're the people that are, we've pulled people out of our core services to run this local um, contact or case tracing service. And they've come largely from our local wellbeing service run by leisure services and our neighborhood and community services. So they know their local communities really well, particularly I would say BAME communities where we've got much higher risk. Um, the services are open eight till eight, 10 to one at week in the week, 10 to one at weekends. Um, it's a local voice when they do speak to somebody who's speaking to them about their community. And I think the other thing that it's helping us with is it's giving us local insight. Because of course what you do when you make that contact is you go through the, the script that the national team uses and try and elicit the contacts. We then feed those contacts back into the national system. But as part of that conversation, People are telling us things about where they think they got it, you know, what they think the risks are, the difficulties they've got. I think of all the things though we contribute to doing that locally is that we're able not just to take their details and feed them into a computer program, but we're able to offer them local support on debt counseling, uh, connect them to the hub, offer them support to self-isolate. Now, of course, we've got the self-isolation payment so we can steer people from that initial contact through that self-isolation payment system. Um, we're offering a much more wraparound service and people trust us more. 
Um, and you know that local insight we get and that local relationship we're able to form through that local contact tracing does seem to also be um, heard in the community. You know, people are much more willing to talk to the local authority and to be able to access our service and welcome being able to access our services. And it's a much more localized and relevant function. Thank and it, you. it's Barbara? enabled us to understand much more uh, what the nature of our problem is. Thank you. Just one more question, if I can. And can I say congratulations to your local team on those excellent results? Uh, perhaps you could tell us two things, really. What, one, how many people you have been deploying in that role? Um, because obviously we've got the national system handling <coughs> bulk, but perhaps not handling it particularly well. Do you think that if you, uh, in Blackburn with Darwin, given your proportion of the national contact tracing budget, you could scale up your contact tracing service quickly to contact, to carry on contacting the 80s or 90% of the contacts? Um, and what would you need to achieve that level? So if it were a shift from the national resource to, to local and you got your share of the resources, could you do that? And just to give us an idea how many people are currently working on it. Yeah, well, we're getting, on average, we've been referred about 31 cases a day, although it can be a bit erratic. Sometimes the numbers are much lower, sometimes much higher. We've pulled about, because of course, what we've had to do is train those people we've pulled out of their day jobs to do it. Uh, and we've done that with Public Health England. So um, we've got a, a rolling number of staff who are trained to do that and come in uh, to meet the, the demand as we get different numbers referred. So I think we've got about uh, around 20 people um, trained and able to come in at different times, be, be called in from their day job. Um, if we were, we did a back of the envelope calculation for Lancashire as a whole, uh, as to how many staff we would get if the national numbers from the national test and trace system were allocated to us, we think it's about six or 700. That's for the whole of Lancashire. Um, so for Blackburn with Darwin, of course, the numbers would be much less, um, around 100 and something. But that would make a transformational difference if we had that resource uh, or staff at local level. I think it would need to be the resource so that we could employ local people to do it, because that's part of what the value is. Um, clearly, I think when we've discussed it across Lancashire, we, have, we think it might work better with the mainstream calls done on a Lancashire level and then um, the more complex cases done at the very local level. Um, at the moment, our discussions with the national system are going well and we're trying to get a blended system of the national system, you know, contacting the cases and uh, completing them where they're able but to try and get more and more of that capacity at a local level. I think one of the problems we've got is that if you look at wealthier areas where you don't have a challenge of, uh, for instance, high ethnicity um, cases, the national test and trace system seems to be performing reasonably well. I think the challenge comes where you've got uh, lower income communities, high BAME populations, and uh, more social and economic challenges. And there, the national test and trace system, the contact tracing rates are dramatically lower, you know, in the early 50%. And of course, that risk then is multiple for those, for our communities, for my community. So the national test and trace system performance with those numbers, I think is partly what has caused the continued spread across our borough the failure to, to work effectively, even when we had low numbers in the summer, uh, because in the summer, the, the number of contacts being completed by the national system for Blackburn with Darwin was in the early 50%. Uh, and that was a contributor to continued transmission. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's really important. I give you answer. Thank you very much, uh, Barbara. Uh, Carol Monaghan and then uh, Neil Hanby. Thanks very much, Chair, and can I thank the witnesses for the evidence they've given this morning. Um, it's, it's been really interesting to listen to. Um, a recent YouGov piece of research was published that said that um, self-isolation or adherence to self-isolation amongst people with um, potential COVID symptoms could be as low as 18%. That's one eight percent um, Where are we going wrong and what can we do to improve these figures? Who's that too, Carol? 
Um, well, maybe maybe if we start with um, Professor Harrison again. Professor Harrison. Yeah. Um, well, our experience of um, talking to people who have been asked to self-isolate, um, what uh, is that the economic challenges are probably one of the main barriers to compliance. So if you are um, on zero hours contract or a taxi driver who earns their money, you know, um, by being out, even the self-isolation payment is probably not going to cover the income you would have got. Um, so that's the first problem. The second problem is that people are reluctant to give their full list of contacts because what they don't want to do is to cause uh, the rest of their family who perhaps are, have one um, basic um, low wage income earner in a household. They don't want to have to trigger them into self-isolation and to lose their capacity to feed their families. So we've, we've seen, for instance, over the summer, um, a little bit less recently, but the National Test and Trace system was only getting three contacts per case interviewed, um, which seems improbable during the summer. Um, and uh, we feel people are under-reporting the number of contacts they probably really had because what they're doing is protecting their family members and friends from being identified and being asked to self-isolate as close contacts. Now, the answer, I think, is a stronger, more committed system of support for those self-isolating, such as other countries have had. Um, I mean, the payment that we do now have for those self-isolating, which is £500, is very welcome and is being highly utilised. And so we, you know, we that has made a difference. Thank you. Um, so sorry, can, I, can, I, can I maybe just interrupt you there? Sorry to interrupt yep. you while you're speaking. I mean, but if you're talking about countries that have uh, better financial supports in place, um, if we look at somewhere like, for example, South Korea, who we know has been extremely successful in terms of its contact tracing, is it because they have had better financial supports or are there societal reasons as well that might make the behaviour of people in, in South Korea more likely to follow the rules, be more compliant? No, that's a good question and I do, I do think there are cultural factors at play. But I think for most communities and most individuals, there is a general willingness to comply with self-isolation. Um, but uh, there's a different level of capacity to do so across different communities. And I think that's why we're seeing uh, the rates much higher um, amongst um, middle-class professional workers who can work from home or big city uh, uh, workers in um, higher skilled jobs who can work from home. Self-isolations uh, and, and will also continue to get their, their normal pay whilst they're self-isolating. That's a very different prospect to somebody who is trying to, is uh, living hand to mouth on a basic income and for whom if they self-isolate the whole household capacity to pay rent uh, and have food uh, is diminished. You know, so we're not talking about the same challenges to across the whole community. Carol? Thank you. Um, the other things that we've seen in um, East Asian countries are uh, for example, they have moved positive cases or contacts of positive cases into enforced, shall we call it, self-isolation perhaps in a hotel. Um, is this something we should be looking at more, more carefully? I think one of our challenges in uh, high transmission areas, particularly where we've got high South Asian or BAME communities, is that um, as soon as you're a confirmed case, if you then have to go home and self-isolate, and if your house is a pre-1919 terrorist house with a large multi-generational family, it's almost impossible not to infect the rest of your family, realistically. Um, and of course, we are giving as much guidance and support as we can to people self-isolating as a confirmed case in a, in a small terrorist house that's multi-generational. Um, but the ask for them is very different to the ask for the average uh, member of the population. I think at some point uh, um, we may want to consider 
putting people up in hotels as soon as they're a confirmed case rather than sending them back to infect their families. Uh, because it isn't just South Asian families that are uh, being infected by the, by the index case, by the first case. Um, and I think it's a risk we haven't really grappled with. When we've looked in Blackburn with Darwin at what percentage of um, the confirmed cases are clustering in households and in lower super output areas. So a lower super output area is about 1,500 population, a few streets. And what we can see in the patterns of spread by the postcodes is that there isn't an even distribution of confirmed cases. They're clustering, the cases are clustering in houses and clustering at lower super output uh, level areas. Um, and that is due to the fact that um, an index case may be um, in the most infected group, which would be 16 to 29 year olds, who may well be asymptomatic is becoming infected, uh, then taking unknowingly the virus home to the family. The first person to, to show symptoms will be an older member in that household. The whole household goes to get tested. And then what we see is um, cluster, household clusters. But we're also seeing clusters of households in lower super output areas. Thank and you. that distribution is very uneven across the community. So I think some measure of further control for the index case, the first person infected in a household would make a, a big difference. And certainly in Southeast Asia, their way of dealing with that has been to say, as soon as you're confirmed, uh, we will put you up in a hotel. Thank you. So you don't go back to your family. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And finally, uh, Neil Hanby had a brief question. Thank you very much, Chair, and thanks to all the witnesses today for uh, their e excellent testimony. Um, I I'd just like to pick up on one uh, point uh, from Professor Ham. Um, you, you, know, you commented that movement on testing over the summer was too slow, um, and I, I would just like to ask specifically about that. Would it have been possible, or were there uh, any specific impediments to um, beyond having the will um, that, that prevented a significant expansion of the testing capacity at that time? So uh, if you look at what's happened on testing, the government's very much focused on building the capacity in the commercial lighthouse laboratories, did that quickly and successfully up until the summer. I think expanded the capacity to around about 200 250,000 a week but of course we discovered early in September when the schools went back when people went back to work when people came back from holiday there was growing demand for tests and the bottlenecks that were well publicized at the time thankfully we've overcome that and we're in a much better position now but if more had been done during the summer months when the case rates were low and we had that opportunity and we could have made greater use, for example, of the university laboratories, of NHS laboratories. Paul Nurse has been very vocal on this over a long period of time, drawing in the expertise in the research institutes like the Crick. Then we might have been able to add capacity to avoid that bottleneck having occurred. But it looks like with the new capacity coming on stream now from the lighthouse labs that have been commissioned, we have the ability to do more tests than there seems to be the demand for. I think the worry now is why isn't there more demand from the community given increasing infection rates? And that's something I'm sure the committee will want to explore. Thank you very much indeed. Can I uh, thank um, our three witnesses uh, this morning for their uh, evidence? Uh, and perhaps say particularly um, through Dominic Harrison to your fellow uh, directors of public health uh, and their teams and local Public Health England teams across the country. Uh, we uh, applaud and recognise the, the very hard and important work uh, that you're doing. We're grateful for uh, your speaking, not on their behalf today, but uh, giving us an insight uh, into the work that you do locally. Uh, thank you very much indeed. I'm now going to hand thank over you. to Jeremy Hunt to share, the, to share the next uh, session and introduce the next set of witnesses. Thank you, Greg. And for this panel, we're going to di uh, dive a bit more deeply into the issues around testing. Uh, we're delighted to welcome Professor Sir John Bell, who is Regis Chair of Medicine at the University of Oxford, Professor Joe Martin, President of the Royal College of Pathologists, and Dr. Gerard Krauser, who is the Director of the German Institute for Infectious Disease Epidemiology. 
thank you all very much for joining us today. And I'd like to start, if I may, with, with Sir John, who is a regular visitor to uh, both the Science and Technology and the Health and Social Care Committee. Uh, thank you for joining us. Before we look at testing, can I just ask you to comment briefly on something you said yesterday about the Pfizer vaccine announcement, namely that we could be back to normal by the spring. I just wonder, was that your natural Canadian optimism or do you have some more scientific grounds for such confidence? Well, I, I, look, I think this journey to a vaccine has been a, has been a long journey. And I think it, there's a risk that people will underestimate the importance of the announcement yesterday. Um, and, and that is that the big challenge here was to find a vaccine that actually had efficacy against this virus. There are many pathogens for which we have looked for decades and not found a vaccine that works, including incidentally respiratory syncytial virus and upper respiratory virus that we, it took us 35 years to get to a vaccine that uh, potentially works. Malaria, we haven't got a vaccine. HIV, we haven't got a vaccine. So I think everybody's sort of taken it as a given somebody will produce a vaccine. Not true. So yesterday we broke through that and that I think is a massive step forward. Now, are there some more things we need to do? We've got to get a regulatory approval. We've got to get more material manufactured. We have to get it distributed. It'd be hard to distribute because it has to be distributed at minus 80, which would be complicated. But, but it also signals, I think, that many of the other vaccines that are, have the same immunogenicity are likely also to be efficacious. So I wouldn't be surprised if we hit the new year with two or three vaccines, all of which could be distributed. And that's why I'm quite optimistic of getting enough vaccinations done in the first quarter of next year that by spring, things will start to look much more normal than they do now. So if I was going to treat you as, as a lawyer and say, what are, our, what are your percentage chances in this situation of getting to Easter and having vaccinated the vulnerable, the most vulnerable parts of our population so that post Easter, we could think about resuming to normality. What, what sort of percentage chance do you think we've got? Now, I think we've got a 70 to 80% chance of doing that. That's provided they don't screw up the distribution of the vaccine. That's not my job, but provided they don't screw that up, it'll all be fine. Okay, thank you. Well, anyway, that is, uh, I think, very good news. Um, now, we, Professor Witte has told the uh, Science and Technology Select Committee before that test and trace is more effective at lower levels of transmission. So just putting the discussions about the vaccine on one side for a moment, I just wonder, do you think we've got to levels of transmission in the community now where we should look at adopting population level testing? And do we have technologies now that make that possible? Well, as you know, I've spent, well, since July, I've been busy trying to work through whether there are methodologies which you could distribute widely in the community and where the turnaround times are short, repeat testing is a possibility where they're cheap, relatively easy to use, and they have both specificity and sensitivity that make them usable. And to date, we found about six lateral flow tests out of about 50 that we've looked at that fulfill those requirements. The validation of those will be published tomorrow. Uh, the data looks much better than I personally expected it to look. These are pretty good tests. And as you know, the work we're doing in Liverpool at the moment is a first crack at seeing whether we can get population-wide testing. So I think that's a, that is now a, a distinct possibility. Can I bring in Professor Martin on that point? Do you think uh, we're at the point where we could seriously look at population level testing? Yes, I agree with uh, Professor Bell on that. Uh, we've expanded capacity substantially and with new technologies coming on, I think that's a, a possibility. Um, caveat, again, not easy. Uh, consumable supplies, equipment supplies, getting personnel on the ground, getting the distribution sorted and getting the IT um, that backs that up, uh, particularly to get our, our results back into our colleagues in public health will be absolutely essential. Having systems that work end to end. It's not, it's not as simple as, you know, just having a test, pressing a button, you've got to 
put it in the community context. Thank you. And um, I've got some colleagues who I want to bring in, and we also want to hear from Dr. Krauser. But I just wanted to ask you one other question, um, referring back to something Professor Ham said in the earlier session. He, he referred to Sir Paul Nurse, uh, who commented famously that we should think about the little ships, in other words, the smaller laboratories, university laboratories, hospital laboratories, when we were ramping up our testing capacity over the spring and summer. Um, we have obviously now got to substantial testing capacity, but do you think it would have been an easier journey if we'd followed Sir Paul Nurse's advice? So, Sir Paul Nurse and the Crick worked very closely with um, a, an NHS laboratory, the HSL laboratories, um, to get that testing up and running at the Crick. And I think that's that's one very important thing. The Royal College of Pathologists is, is emphasised throughout, and we published a, a strategy, a very helpful testing strategy in June, re-emphasising the need to keep things joined up. If you have lots of little ships, that's fine, but they need to be coordinated and you need to have those data flows. The NHS labs at the beginning of the pandemic were desperate to ramp up testing. They all wanted to, to, to ramp up levels of testing, but at the time we had very bad uh, constraints. We had very severe constraints in equipment and consumables. Bear in mind, these, these were all new tests coming on stream at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and effectively there wasn't enough to go around and this was global this wasn't just the uk uh, this was a global shortage of the consumables we still don't have as much as we would like uh, there are big international suppliers which have capped the uk um, U uk supply of consumables but they've done an enormous amount with it um, i think the capacity uh, within the H NHS has, has ramped up hugely. Um, the universities, there are some very, very good university NHS partnerships working very well. And I think the as we go forward, one of the important things will be to have a legacy that's actually sustainable from these. Because standing up and standing down labs is actually quite disruptive in the long term. So. But I just, just to press impact. you, sorry, if I could just press you a bit, I think what you're saying is that it wasn't strategically wrong to set up the Lighthouse Laboratories Absolutely. if you're wanting to process huge volumes of tests. Is, is that right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I personally would have liked to have seen more um, awareness of the end-to-end -end process. So you talk about high-scale lab laboratories, the pathology laboratories for the health services process 1.1 billion tests a year. So in terms of high throughput, the NHS does high throughput testing. Every, every year, that's what we do. Um, and, and so we are good at high throughput testing, but with that end-to-end -end process. And setting up, setting up the lighthouses with an independent IT system um, is, is, is probably something that we've learned from, um, and that's changed. And so that data is now flowing much better from the lighthouses through into the regional public health and into now local public health and, and primary care where you need it. Thank you. Barbara Keeley. Thank you, Chair. So uh, questions again to Professor Sir John Bell and Professor Joe Martin. Um, going back to the, uh, the the trial of mass testing that we're seeing in the city of Liverpool, what do you see as the main advantages and challenges of using those rapid point of care tests on a mass scale? And you know, perhaps you could also mention uh, are, are there concerns about accuracy of those rapid tests compared to the RT PCR testing? Yeah. So the um, the advantages of these tests is that first of all, the turnaround time is pretty fast, so you don't have to wait a day or two to get the result. That, of course, has immediate advantages if you find positives because they can be quarantined immediately. That's a huge advantage. Uh, they're also relatively cheap and you can reuse them. So, uh, sorry, not reuse them, you can use them sequentially 
very readily so you can set up a system of testing where everybody gets tested once a week or twice a week or whatever and and you can also i think rather more intensively track contacts to see if they're becoming uh, infected or not so there are, are lots of advantages that the I, I started i have to say when i started to uh, look at the validation of these tests i started being very skeptical about whether they would have the kind of accuracy that you need to do this but i have to say i uh, and as I say, the data will all be published tomorrow, but the validation data we've done, at least on these six tests, is very impressive indeed. They're not quantitative PCR tests. I think um, you, everybody needs to understand that. Th there are advantages to that because, of course, people carry RNA in their throats a long time after they've stopped being infectious. So these are identifying the people with high live virus in their nose and throats. Uh, and in doing so, they catch the people who are most likely to spread the virus to other people. They will not, I have to say, catch everybody. And I think that's a really important note. They won't catch everybody, but everybody they do catch, if you look at it this way, would be somebody, particularly in the asymptomatics, would be somebody who you would never catch with the previous system, because you don't have the, so the, most of these people are not getting tested. So everybody you catch is a win. And as a result, I think you're making really substantial inroads into identifying people who are asymptomatic, who are infectious and transmitting disease, and who you can actually then uh, quarantine. Okay, it's, uh, just, just one small follow-up point. I mean, if somebody had symptoms and, and then took one of these rapid tests, would getting a negative back be enough for them to stop self-isolating, or would you have to still say to them, you, you must you must serve out the 10 days or the 14 days of yourself isolation. Well, the, the ONS data is very clear on this. 95% of people with symptoms do not have the disease. So most people with these symptoms are hypochondriacs. So, you know, that, so, so you know, we, that, that, that is a clear association. It came out of the ONS survey. There's no ambiguity about it. If you use symptoms as the only way of identifying people, you'll be locking down a lot of people who shouldn't be locked down. Okay. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. And Professor Martin, on the um, on the advantages and challenges of those rapid tests. Yeah. So, so testing, testing, and the method methodologies you use, as as Professor Bell says, um, needs to be in context. So these are not tests that we would necessarily use for diagnosis of somebody coming into an A and E department. Uh, we would use a, a different technology, probably PCR based at the moment, until we got uh, better sensitivity and specificity tests coming on coming on the but certainly better sensitivity tests coming on board but in terms of of ease of use <coughs> which broadens out um, broadens out the capabilities uh, particularly around public health control um, I think that's really I think these are very promising we'll have to see how they do in in reality very importantly, particularly if we're going to use them for asymptomatic staff testing, we need to make sure that people then don't stop using PPE and they don't stop social distancing. So the, the messaging around this has to be absolutely right. Our, our, you know, all our uh, pathology teams know really, really well, or in, all our um, you know, amazing infection control teams know very well this is part of a control strategy. It's a risk reduction, not a risk removal strategy. So then if I could just ask another follow up then, the, the, the notion that you could have this rapid testing use and then people could be admitted to theatres and you know other crowd situations, that's, that's not where we're at. People would still have to observe social distancing. Yeah, we've got to be really careful about opening up high risk environments, you know, football matches and cinemas and all that stuff. We're, we're some distance from that at the moment. I think we've got to go more carefully. We're, they're being used in universities and schools and then the, the citywide testing in Liverpool, which is not intended to free people up to go because we're under a lockdown. So it's quite a good set of circumstances to test out the test. It is, um, yeah. So, so, the, so the messaging is important that we don't get into seeing these rapid tests as a way of, you know, freeing people up to go into crowds and, and so on. Yeah. No, that's right. Exactly. Thank you.
Dean Russell. Is Dean here? No, in that case, uh, let's go to Luke Evans. Thank you very much, Chair. And uh, building on what Sir John said, my questions are to uh, Professor Martin regarding um, understanding PCR and lessons learned. So um, in, in simple terms, my understanding of PCR is that, it, that with the reverse transcription, you um, pick up the RNA, you multiply it over and over, you have a cycle limit set um, that tells yeah. you whether or not you've uh, had the test. Could you give me what you believe the false positives and the false negatives are uh, around that and the values you've seen for that test? The false positives and false negatives. So, so it operates at about a level of 97% and it depends very much on the circumstances. So the, so the implications of a false negative and false positive are different in different circumstances. So at high population levels, you'll find the, the false positive rate drops at low population levels. Uh, you, you have to worry much more about the, about the false positives. So the, the, the impact of getting a result that's wrong is different for different circumstances. So, so that's really important to do take into well, account looking at that so you don't want uh false negatives going on to a in a into an a in, into an accident emergency department you don't want a negative somebody who's actually positive but testing negative going on to a pop onto a ward where they might infect people or the other way around you know we don't want to give people um the virus in a in a care setting Absolutely. through having a false positive or a false negative result. And so picking that up, can you um, would you mind commenting on, there, there's, a, there's a debate raging on the level of cycles that should be used for amplification and where it comes. I'd be grateful if you'd be able to set the record straight as, uh, from the, the Royal College of Pathologists or where, what, every uh, test that you do, be it testing haemoglobin has a wide margin and who's doing it. Would you be able yeah. to comment on that and set that record straight? So, so Public Health England have got a, you know, a cycle threshold for, for PCR, absolutely fine, 35. Lots of debate, debate about that 30 to 36 window. Um, and not all technologies are absolutely comparable in this as well. So some of the rapid PCR tests, which are, are actually very effective, have CQ times, not CT. So you have to have to join them all up. One of are you the happy? Oh, sorry. Are you happy with that threshold? Is it? Do you think that's a sensible threshold set? I think we. I think we're learning more about it the whole time, and it also depends on whether you've got the capacity to to double test. So some tests are against one gene target. Some tests are against two. If you've got a low level positive on one gene target, but it's negative on the other one, then you're probably happy to call it a negative. In, in, in most circumstances, if it comes up positive on both, you would call it a positive. Or if you repeat it using a different technology, that's, that's a way of reassuring yourself. This is all under very active discussion as we get more and more data. Our, you know, pay enormous tribute to our, our clinical scientists, our laboratory scientists who are working with shifting you know, shifting data, new technology the whole time. Well, I'm really pleased you said that, and, and I'm very grateful to, to them too, because pulling those together, the false positives, the false negatives, the, the cycle threshold, yeah, when you yeah. turn that into surveillance, the Health Select Committee was very keen to have mass testing of the, yeah. the NHS, and it's now being talked about. Um, in the lessons learned, do you think that the PCR could have been brought in for mass testing? What would the implications have been on a workforce if you're having false negatives or false positives, as you rightly called out? Because we haven't heard the reasonings why this was done so uh, you know right from the beginning we've been very constrained by equipment and, and, and supplies so the the volumes um, I think virtually every lab in the country would have said yes we can do more with more with more kit and, and, and more supplies um, we've been constrained as I said global globally it's it's been problematic uh, most laboratories have had to change the technologies that they've been using, certainly they, across the health services, three or four times during this because they've not been able to use particular platforms because they haven't had the consumables for it. 
Um, that's happened at the, the Mayo's apparently got 20 different platforms, all so that they can maintain a service in the, in the face of different shortages. And, and that's been happening across the UK. So a, a lab that was, was had a six hour turnaround on a Thermo, Thermo Fisher platform at the beginning, couldn't get the supplies. To so sort it out. They run, they, yeah, yeah, so they're not able to run it. So the, the, it would have been fantastic you know, the Royal College of Pathologists was very clear. We wanted to do lots more testing. We wanted to do staff testing, roll it out as much as we can, but it's, it's supply constraints has been a real problem. And going forward for mass surveillance using PCR, what are your concerns with regard to virus shedding, people having RNA still in their system and mass positive tests? Because the concern is if you're having um, people repeatedly test, you may have tested back positive in March, had symptoms at that time, working in the front line. You could lose your surgical team very, very quickly for something that doesn't need to be done. Could you comment on that aspect? So I think as, as, as we've understood more about long-term shedding and not repeating tests, so one of the tricks is not to, if you've got a confirmed positive, don't repeat test them. Uh, that's, that's, very, that's very important because we know shedding can go on for a, a very long time. We know live viruses, you know, in the terms of shedding, the live virus transmission is very low. Um, Hong Kong's been using a, a cycle threshold of 30 and, you, and combining it with serology um, to, so they've been using IgG um, uh, and, and IgM in some places, the serology, uh, and, and then classifying people as non-infectious uh, once they've got a, a, low, a low viral threshold and positive uh, appropriate serology in a, in a decent time frame. And, and is that something the UK would which you you would advocate for the UK to take on if we're using mass to to, to to line it with IgM and IgG? So I have a lot of incredibly skilled immunologists and virology colleagues, and as we as we look at the data coming from the UK, I think it's going to be important for them to opine on that. It's not. And final that... final question: um, yeah. When this is all over, we've created a huge industry off the back of about six weeks. What do you want to see that industry used for in the future? So um, this is not my first pandemic. You know, HIV when I was, you know, and, and it won't be our last. Um, so we hope that it won't be as bad. Uh, but you always will need a stand up capacity for major incidents and major um, disease um, outbreaks. Uh, we've got public health surveillance for that. So there will be a legacy on this. One of the most important legacies of this whole system we've created, I, I think it's gone largely unnoticed, has been the IT links that we've created between the health service and public health lab laboratories. So before this, we had sev several labs, but not large scale. But over the course of very, very few weeks, um, early in the pandemic, we linked up 96 health service and the public health laboratories with a common messaging system. So this inter interoperability, the, the, we use the National Pathology Exchange System, and that's a real invest in uh, a long term investment in the UK infrastructure, um, in, in the UK health's infrastructure, and that's going to be a lasting legacy, obviously. You know, more IT investment would be would be uh, would be uh, very good. But pay tribute to NHSX for that, Simon Eccles um, and the NHS t X team for for working with the MPEX and all the all the labs on that. Thank you very um, much, Professor okay. Martin. You, um, sorry, I just want to make sure we have time for um, Dr. Yeah. Krauser, um, who's got some very important evidence. So, Dean Russell and then Greg Clark, and then we'll move on to Dr. Krauser. Thank you. I actually did want to ask uh, Dr. Krauser my question. Is that okay? Um, okay, well, I'll tell you, what, I'll bring you in at the end, if I may, Dean. Um, thank you. Let me yes. go over to Greg Clark. Uh, thank you very much, uh, indeed, Jeremy. Um, I've got a question about uh, uh, isolation, but I just wanted to pick up on uh, some points, or a particular point, uh, that um, Sir John Bell uh, made to Jeremy. Um, First of all, we should put on record uh, our thanks to uh, to you uh, with the Vaccines Task Force for the uh, for the progress that we've made in securing supplies of these vaccines. Uh, it is a good example of anticipation 
that both of our committees uh, have commended, and I know that you've been particularly vigorous in that. But I noticed that you said to the chair that uh, things, it's all pretty good news, green lights uh, ahead, but it depends on the distribution of vaccines. Um, who's responsible for distributing the vaccines? Well, my understanding is that falls to the Department of Health and Social Care, and that they would in turn, I suspect, rely on NHS functions to do that. But this, so if we get two or three vaccines, which I suspect we will by the new year, then they will have different routes of distribution, in my view. Some of them are you administer just like the flu vaccine. Um, the Pfizer vaccine needs a cold chain of, at minus 80. Minus 80 is liquid nitrogen to the bedside. And so I can't, you know, the idea that that'll be done through local GPs, it sounds a bit unlikely to me. So I, I think they're going to have to have a bespoke solution for the Pfizer vaccine, which is absolutely worth it. But they'll have to think quite hard about how they're going to do that. Do you have any visibility as to whether that bespoke solution has been established in anticipation of a rapid rollout? Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't have any visibility of the solution. I do have visibility of the, of the, of the discussion about what the solution might be. That, that is absolutely going on uh, at the moment. And, and I think we've been aware that this was potentially a constraint on distribution for RNA vaccines. And so there has been some previous thought about what that might look like. But it's now, now it's sort of game on. We've got to get it in place so that we don't get delayed by distribution when the thing gets approved. And we need to get it in place, what, in the next two or three weeks? Yeah, well, I think so, yeah. So, so, it, uh, so to be clear, the safety data on the Pfizer vaccine is still to come in. I don't think there's any uh, red, la red, red flags there, but they'll have to assemble it, and then it'll have to go to regulators. So I'm not expecting a regulatory approval from the FDA or European regulators for about three weeks, I suspect. But then once that's happened, we need to be ready to go. And so we're talking about mid-December, I think we should be ready to, ready to administer the vaccine. Uh, thank you, Sir John. And Mike, a uh, question for, uh, for your evidence today uh, was, I saw you listening very intensively to, um, intently to uh, Dominic Harrison, the Director of Public Health, um, when he said that people don't want to, uh, to give the names of their contacts because they don't want them to have to suffer isolation, as it were, and there's only about three names are being given. Do, do you think that it's reasonable to ask people without symptoms who have been in contact with an infected person uh, to isolate for 14 days? So the, the data on this is pretty clear, and that is only very few of those people actually are infected. And the, in order to prevent a single transmission, you have to isolate 70 of those people for one day. So it's, it's massively ineffective. And the trouble is that the people out there know it's massively ineffective. That's why they hate it. Um, um, now, when you do whole lockdowns, it's 1,000 people a day to stop one transmission. So that's why people don't like that either. So what we've got to do, in my view, is move to a setting where, in fact, the that ratio is much improved. So if you've got, if you're quarantining people who've got symptoms and have a positive PCR, then you only have to quarantine them for, you only have to have five of those people quarantined for a day to stop one transmission. That's massively effective. And similarly, if you take people who are mass tested with lateral flow tests, the number is probably less than five. So we, I think we have to start to get a bit more pragmatic about what are efficient ways of reducing transmission, because at the moment, it, my view is contact tracing is not very efficient. So, in other words, we should test people who've been caused to isolate, that have been in contact, yeah. and we should release them if they test negative. Yeah, and, and the, the methodology is now there. So you could lateral flow test people every other day if they were a contact. And if they don't turn positive, then they haven't got the disease, and off they go. Uh, and they could, you could do that without having to quarantine them. They could do that in real life, and it would all be fine. And as a result, I think you'd find the compliance to the, to the contact tracing regime would go up enormously. I think there's a big problem with our current philosophy of contact tracing and quarantining, and that it's, it's all based around a big stick. 
that beats people up. And I, I don't think we're looking at it as a mechanism to enable people to do things that they wouldn't otherwise do. And I think a, an enablement strategy is the right way to get buy-in. So for example, we're now in a world of vaccines. We're gonna have to, when we give somebody a vaccine, they're gonna have to have freedoms to freedom to operate because they're protected against the vaccine. We're gonna have to give them a ticket that says, yeah, and if you wanna go to the cinema, you can go to the cinema. So we're gonna to have to get used to the fact that we're going to enable people who are protected from the virus. If you've had the virus and you're swab positive by PCR, for example, you're protected for at least 90 days and probably for more. So you can't keep saying to those people, well, we'll lock you up for two weeks and then you gotta go back to the normal routine. You've gotta to say to them, no, no, you'll be okay. You can go on the trains, you can go to the cinema, you wanna to go to the football match. That's going to, and we're going to have vaccine. People are going to be vaccinated. I can tell you, if I get two shots of the vaccine and people say, no, no, you still can't go to the football match, I'm not going to be very happy about it. So, you know, we, we're living now in a world where we need to open society back up again, and we need a structure to do that. And at the moment, we don't have that structure because the whole philosophy has let's beat them up with a stick rather than let's give them a carrot. To do so we need to well. change that philosophy, but as you've made clear in your evidence uh, and before, we've now got testing capacity, both PCR and natural yes. flow tests. Yes. Why aren't we doing it? Well, I, I, that, that, those, <laughs> you might well say, uh, those conversations are going on at the moment. Um, uh, and, and I think they, they are incredibly urgent. So let me tell you, the, the, our field studies, to date have been very interesting of lateral flow tests. And that is we go to universities where the kids have had a very, very bad time and only 30% of the kids are interested in having a test. And the reason they're not interested in having a test is because not only do they not want to be locked up again themselves, but they don't want all their mates to be locked up. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's a massive disincentive of people participating in a mass testing program. So we've got to flip that around, otherwise, Nobody's going to take the tests, and then you, you know, that's the end of the mass testing program. So you, this has to be about enablement. You have to be giving people something which they wouldn't otherwise have, which they want to have, and then you'll have queues of people trying to get tested, and it'll all be fine. But so it's, a, it's a real problem, and, and it's come out loud and clear in schools, in universities, and it's beginning to come out in Liverpool. I can't share that data with you yet, but it's starting to be clear that it's a problem in Liverpool as well. So your view is that we should be testing people who've been asked to isolate now and releasing them if they test negative? Yeah, I, so, so my view is you, you test people. If they've got a positive result, you ask them to quarantine for two weeks and you ensure they quarantine for two weeks. And if they behave themselves and they quarantine for two weeks, you give them a freedom pass for three months. And you say, you've had the disease, you can go and do anything you want for three months, it's fine. If they test negative, they can then have a couple of days to freedom because you know that they're not infected. If they're a contact, you test them every other day, but leave them to go about their business in the real world. So there are, there are advantages to everybody from this. The negatives do better, the positives do better, and people will want to be tested because it's an opportunity to get back to normal life. Thank you very much. I, I, it's, I think it's not that complicated, but we do need to get on with it. Thank you very much. And uh, last but not least, and thank you for being so patient, I want to bring in Dr. Gerard Krauser, who's the director of the German Institute for Infectious Disease Epidemiology, joining us from Germany today. Um, Dr. Krauser, Germany has had one of the most admired responses to coronavirus in Europe. I just want to ask you, why do you think Germany has been so much more successful at containing the virus and keeping death rates down compared to other big European countries? Um, to be honest, I don't know. And I would also be careful with the assessment. I always say we should make the assessment in two years or so and see the overall balance <clears throat> and then come back to that question. Um, but there are some indications. One is definitely that the government from the very first moment on has acknowledged this pandemic to be a pandemic and has uh, made clear the serious uh, risks associated with it. Um, the second thing is that the German healthcare system 
is very much privatized and very much decentralized. And that has enabled test capacity to be uh, uh, upscaled in, in, a, in a velocity that I think was probably un, uncompared in any other country. And one of the reasons is that we happen to have one of the most <laughs> renowned coronavirus uh, uh, researchers in our country, Christian Drosten. And um, he developed the test kit and made it available very quickly. So there was at no point the notion of having a centralized test capacity that would claim to be the only one to know how to run this test. And I think all experts here would agree running a PCR is not magic. And um, so having uh, a large number of uh, highly automatized, highly capacitated private laboratories and capacitating them or allowing them to run the tests. And I must admit also connected with a lot of financial incentive to it because each of those tests is paid by the health security system. So it's almost like a money printing machine. So that has allowed for testing to be available and to be scaled up very rapidly, very soon. Yet I'm not a, a, a promoter of an unfocused generalized testing strategy because even under those conditions, you still get limitations um, and be them only in time that the test result is not available as soon as you would have would want it to be. So I'm, I promote to still introduce some sort of prioritization and the Robert Koch Institute, the National Public Health Institute in Germany is actually now doing that to my notion with some delay, but is now doing that to focus the testing for those where the need is most urgent. And that would be people who have symptoms and among those who have symptoms, people with defined risk factors for severe outcome. So I think that is still important. Thank you. On um, the other hand, the, yeah. No, sorry, please. carry on. So um, also the contact tracing from the very beginning on was one of the very, very strong strategies in Germany and was from the very beginning on the task of the local health departments. So it was very much decentralized. It caused a lot of problems because I must admit that the local health departments in Germany have for decades been underfinanced and understaffed. Nevertheless, being decentralized still allowed for them to do a decent job and to maintain the strategy. It was actually maintained throughout. So at no point was the contact tracing stopped or deemed unnecessary. I don't want to leave it as if everything was perfect. Um, I think uh, the German government is now running a strategy saying that after a certain number of cases per 100,000 inhabitants per seven days, a local health department is not able anymore to do contact tracing and therefore we need to engage in wide community uh, 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 limitations and business limitations and so on, what you generally refer to as shutdown. Um, I personally do not agree with that approach because I think how efficient and how productive a health department is can be influenced by many, many factors, including what my previous speaker said, many aspects of focusing and prioritization of contact tracing. So there's not necessarily a need to maintain contact tracing for everyone and every contact person, but there are multiple ways to focus. You can shorten the quarantine period you can shorten the exposure interval, you can focus on contact person with risk factors and so on and so forth. So not to mention digitalization of those procedures. And how in Germany do you incentivize compliance when someone is asked to isolate because they've been uh, close to someone who tested positive? Uh, we've been hearing this morning about how difficult it is to persuade people because they might lose money or whatever. Um, how do you make that happen in Germany? So the basic infectious disease controller does contain a paragraph that, um, uh, that uh, gives the responsibility of the local health service to recompensate for the person in quarantine for the monetary loss of not having been able to go to work. Um, but most of the times that is not being claimed and not being used. And the reason is that um, 
at least for the public services, and a big part of German's business is in public services, um, there's no immediate financial risk for the individual being under quarantine. It is, of course, a complete different story for many of the small private businesses who are really going bankrupt now. Uh, unemployment um, is a risk. There's also a, short, a certain measurement, a certain tool in German economy. It's called short work um, that uh, reduces the work time for the individual while maintaining the salary paid by the government. So people are still part, are not necessarily need to be fired uh, because of this economic risk. There are some limitations to that, obviously, but my sensation is that, in fact, there's an over incentivization of quarantine and many people actually seem to like to go to quarantine or go to quarantine at least voluntarily uh, because there are also some positive side effects and medicine we call that positive disease effect. What, what, do you know what percentage compliance rates you're getting across Germany? No, I cannot give that number. Okay. Um, Dean Russell has a question. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, Dr. Klaus, uh, thank you for uh, your time. Um, I was fascinated to hear your evidence just now, actually, because I think often from a, a UK-centric point of view, when we talk about what the successes are in other countries, everything sounds like it's running perfectly. And uh, it was fascinating to hear your views of, of the challenges. I was just interested in, in those challenges a bit more. I mean, when it, when it comes to Germany, obviously you will seem to be way ahead of the curve in the early stages. Um, I was just interested to know a little bit more why you think you were so far ahead at the start, but also where Germany is now compared to the UK in terms of testing numbers, but also um, from a general public perception of how the government's doing, because uh, I think every every country is having its challenges. I'd just be interested to see whether ours are similar to yours. Thank you. I must say I have difficulties to make those kind of comparisons because I just don't know enough about the situation in other countries. Um, but uh, one of the reasons why it may have perceived that we were ahead of the curve for quite some time is because the surveillance system in Germany is generally compared to internationally quite a good one. And uh, you know it needs a lot of improvement and we are not happy with it as it is, but compared to many other countries, and I don't want to name a single one, uh, it is quite effective, quite timely. It is to a large extent fairly digitalized. And I think that has helped. It was in fact the German surveillance system that picked up the outbreaks in Austria um, that caused this huge uh, uh, wave in Germany. So it was be we detected the Austrian outbreak before the Austrians themselves did. And that is, has to do with the surveillance system. So I think that has helped. Um, other than that, I'm, I'm not sure what, what made the difference. Probably because the government took it very seriously from the beginning on. I think that has certainly also helped. Okay. Thank you no, thank very you. much indeed. That, that's fascinating um, evidence and I think we've, we've taken away your um, particular belief that having a decentralised system, both for testing and contact tracing, uh, gave Germany some early advantages and, and that's very useful evidence for the committee. Um, we're now, I'm afraid, going to have to move on to the third panel, so I just want to conclude by thanking you, Dr Krauser, for your evidence this morning. Um, also, um, Professor Martin for joining us from the Royal College of Pathologists and our resident Canadian optimist, Professor Sir John Bell, for joining us as well. Thank you all very much indeed. Over to you, Greg. Uh, thank you, Jeremy, and thanks to our last witnesses. I'm pleased to welcome uh, our final two witnesses this morning. Uh, they are Dido Harding, Baroness Harding, who is the Chair of NHS Test and Trace, uh, and Dr Susan Hopkins, who is the Chief Medical Advisor to NHS Test and Trace and Deputy Director of Public Health England's National Infection Service. Um, welcome to you both. Um, perhaps I can start with a question to, uh, to Dido Harding. Um, uh, we've been talking about contact tracing uh, this morning. Um, could you uh, tell us what is the current monthly budget for contact tracing as part of NHS Test and Trace? Um, I haven't got the precise monthly figure in my head, Chair, but as an order of magnitude, the, the total test and trace budget, 80% of that account is accounted for by testing. 
So, and, and the remaining 20% uh, would be a combination of contact tracing, the um, technology and central support functions in, in the overall organisation. So 80% testing, 20% contact tracing and other and services. And um, significant costs in, in technology and, and overhead support, finance, etc. But uh, And within that 20%, what proportion is devoted to the national system and what proportion to the local system of contact tracing? Oh, again, I can write to give you some of the details. I'm sorry, I just don't have that split in my head. What's and your, all, well, you, must, you must have a, well, a sense of it. No, is, it the, is it mostly national, mostly local? No, the reason why I, I don't have the sense in my head is that the contact tracing uh, approach we have is a genuine team of teams. So the test and trace budget that I refer to is the, the NHS test and trace budget, which is separate from the Public Health England budget and the health protection teams in Public Health England are an essential component of our contact tracing and in turn separate from the local authority resource. And so we'd need to put the three together for you. But you've got the, the, the crucial policy question um, in contact tracing uh, is whether this is done nationally or whether it's done locally. Now, surely you must have a feel, deploying the budget, your chair of uh, NHS uh, Test and Trace, do you put most of it into the national uh, effort, as it were, uh, or most of it into the local effort? I don't think either of those are the right approach, actually. I think it's an and, not an either or. And um, as I think previous witnesses have said this morning, uh, we, when I joined Test and Trace um, at the beginning of May, we were in the midst of standing up a very large national contact tracing effort. Since I joined, we have been looking to integrate that and work in real partnership with uh, health protection teams in Public Health England and with local authorities. So it's been moving over time. And, and I'm very supportive of that locally-led, nationally-supported model for contact tracing. But it's clear there's a team. They need to work together. But nevertheless... Yes. Uh, you must know that you, you pay the national team in one way uh, and you reimburse the costs of local authorities um, and local Public Health England teams through different budgets and other ways. So surely you must have some visibility as to whether most of the money is going uh, on the national uh, part of the team, if I can put it that way, and uh, no, whether most is on the local. I just simply don't have the numbers in front of me and um, I'm very happy to, to write and share the detail with you and the committee. Um, but uh, the, the point I'm trying to make is that there are a number of different parts in this team of teams. And, and it's actually important that we're funding all of them, not just one of them. And, and I've got direct control over part of that, but not all of it. Jeremy Hunt. Thank you for joining us, uh, Baroness Harding, and also Dr Susan Hopkins. Uh, can I start by recognising the biggest single achievement of the whole test and trace programme, which is to get up to uh, a capacity of 500,000 tests a day, which you achieved last week, which I think makes it the biggest or one of the very biggest in Europe as a testing programme. You will know that one of the main reasons that we invested from the, the summer on in a big expansion of testing and contact tracing was to try to avoid a second national lockdown and indeed in places that have done testing and tracing, Korea, Singapore, Taiwan and so on, they have avoided any national lockdowns at all. They didn't even have the first one. But we've now gone into our second one. Why do you think it is that you weren't able to, to stem the tide, even despite the expansion that we had? Well, maybe if I give you a sort of operational overview and then um, defer to Susan to give you more of the sort of clinical insights. But I think Firstly, I'd say um, that this second lockdown, as we go into it, we go into it in a very different way than we did the first lockdown. Um, the R number, the rate of infection, is significantly lower than it was in March. You know, over three in March and somewhere between one and one and a half in, in different levels across the country today. Uh, and I think that is in no small part due to the way, as a society, we've changed our behaviours. So we're wearing face masks, we're washing our hands, we're keeping a distance in a way that we didn't understand in February, but also because NHS Test and Trace exists. Uh, it's very hard to disaggregate the effect between the two, um, but there is no doubt that the, the rate of growth of infection is much slower than it was in that first wave. And our ability to understand where 
the disease is spreading fast is so much better than it was. So we're able and have been able through the summer and into the autumn to act more locally and regionally. That wasn't available to us. Um, but to answer your question directly, I'm afraid much as I would love that testing and tracing on its own would be a silver bullet to holding back the tide of COVID. Un unfortunately, the evidence in the UK and in every other country in Europe is that that's not the case. That, that actually the way that we have to tackle the disease is through a variety of different interventions. And, and we are one of the ways, not the only way. I don't know if Susan can elaborate more on the, the, the scientific evidence than, yes, than I. Um, Dr. Hopkins, thank you so much for joining us. I, I'm just trying to understand why it is that um, East Asian countries have been able to avoid uh, not just a second lockdown, but actually even a second wave. Um, many people would say that test and trace is a key reason they've been able to do that. Why is it that we haven't been successful in making that happen here? So I think there's a couple of elements. Uh, I think the first is that the, we never got down to the very small numbers that they did. So single figures in many of the countries, uh, low hundreds in others. Uh, that even when we had very low numbers over the summer, uh, there were undetected cases in the population. And we increasingly recognize the role of asymptomatic transmission uh, uh, that has been recognized from the start, but has been clearly more obvious over the latter few months. And we know that now because the ONS survey tells us that when they um, detect the number of cases that they do by testing a large amount of the population, that only one third of those cases are being tested and detected through symptomatic um, testing that we have offered. So that means that there's a large number out there who are either not coming forward for testing or have ace, are asymptomatic and potentially transmitting. And that means that we, we need to constantly reiterate and uh, keep the distance and keep our contacts low. And one of the reasons why discussions such as Liverpool and uh, uh, where we're trying to find the undetected cases in the population will become more important as we try and slow the spread. Thank you. Um, Dido Harding, can I just come back to you? I, I just want to explore why this is. And I think it's also what Susan Hopkins said about the levels of transmission being so much higher here than, than they are in some of those East Asian countries. So if I just go through a bit of maths, so the ONS say that at the moment there's about 52,000 new infections a day. Uh, your own data says there's about 3.4 contacts per infection, although we have heard this morning it may be higher than that, but that's yeah. what your data says. Theoretically, we therefore should be asking 177,000 people every day to quarantine. But of course, in practice, you don't find out about all those ONS infections. You only find out about just over a third of them. You only reach 60% of the contacts, and only 20% of those actually isolate. So what that means is instead of the theoretical maximum of 177,000 people quarantine, which would be the ideal scenario, actually it's less than 5,000, which is about 3% of, of the total theoretical maximum. Is that maths right? Um, let me take you through each piece, because I would certainly um, challenge a couple of the assumptions that you've, you've made. Um, though I wouldn't challenge the overall direction of travel, that there is considerable drop-off in any test and trace system. You won't get 100% at each stage. But if you take each of them, firstly, I think the, the most... Um, the, the most challenging estimate is exactly how many people are getting the disease each day. And as you say, central estimate from the ONS of circa 50,000 at the moment, though the one thing you know is that the disease is moving. It's either moving up or down. But let's say it's 50,000. We are reaching, we, we are finding circa 20 to 25,000 positive cases a day. So it's more than your third. So it's somewhere between, through the course of um, Test and Trace's existence over the last six months, it's, been, it's moved around between 40 and 50%. It's, it's at the higher end of that at the moment, uh, of the percentage of positive cases that we find. And, and so I think you're completely right, and as Susan's just alluded to, one of the biggest challenges of this disease is hunting out people, finding people who've got the disease who don't know they have it. So I agree at that point. Then the percentage of people of contacts that we reach, again, I think your assumption is a bit low. So on average, um, if I take last week, we contacted 77.8% of contacts for whom um, we had contact details. 
Um, no system can reach people whose contact details we don't have. Um, and so, you know, again, um, that's been reasonably constant through the course of the last um, five, six months. Um, actually, as the scale has grown, um, now, just to give you a sense of the scale, the first week in August, we reached 18,000 people and asked them to isolate. Last week, we reached 311,000 people. So that's a 17-fold growth since the beginning of August. And um, while I, I take your point that um, we need to continue improving that percentage, and as we work more and more with local authorities, um, we're seeing that start to grow. I think, um, as, as the Director of Public Health for Blackburn with Darwin said, they're at 87% through a combination of national and local. Um, nonetheless, you know, my, I've just tried to unpick the maths a bit. Um, I think you're being slightly pessimistic. Um, the, the system is reaching more, um, but you do highlight, let me go to your isolation point at the end as well, there are a number of different surveys. And you know, we live in a, and I'm pleased we live in a liberal democracy, where it's quite hard to track where people are every day. And so all of the data we have on compliance with isolation is based on people reporting what they've done. And there are a, a number of different surveys that, um, that have been done, and you've quoted again probably the most pessimistic. Um, and to, to quote uh, uh, the Chief Medical Officer, Chris Whitty, I don't think you should think of isolation as a black and white one zero thing. That the evidence that we have in, in Test and Trace is that the majority of people are trying very hard to comply when they're asked to. And when they are not, it is because they might have just popped out to get some fresh air. Or if they've gone anywhere, they've gone to buy emergency prescriptions or food that they didn't know how, how else to get. Um, and you know, we, we've got a number of surveys that we're running, and our, our latest one, and you know, we're just this is un-QA'd data, so I sort of hesitate to share it, but um, from some surveys we've run from the end of August through to middle of September shows 54% of people telling us that they didn't leave home during the period that they were asked to isolate. It's not 100%, but it is slightly better than the, the other surveys. So it, it's hard to put a finger on that. And I would like to, sort of, if you sum up, the system gets better and better, the better we get at finding people who have the disease. So the more we're scaling testing, the more we are using mass testing to find asymptomatic cases, it gets better and better. And the more all of us play our part in isolating when we're asked to, the more effective the whole testing and tracing will be. Thank you. I mean, I, I didn't deliberately look for the most pessimistic <laughs> and gloomy numbers. I was actually just looking at the latest reported numbers. But I'm, I'm fully willing to accept that it might be a little bit better than that. But, but even if it's higher than 3% of the people you would potentially want to quarantine, it's probably not going to be much more than 10%. Than it, it certainly won't be more than 20%. And it would be unreasonable to be expecting 100% compliance, considering that you don't even know about a number of these cases. But... But I'm just wondering if the fact that less than one in five of the people that we would theoretically want to quarantine are actually doing so is why SAGE said on the 21st of September that the whole test and trace programme is only having a marginal impact on the transmission of the disease. Well, again, I would just push back gently and say that we shouldn't be expecting um, testing and tracing to account for 100% of the fight against COVID. And clearly, if we were identifying absolutely everyone and everyone was isolating, it would. And that's not realistic in any country in the world for any disease. This is one of, I think the Prime Minister called it on Saturday evening, one of the rays of sunshine. Um, it's not the only one. Um, it's a tool. And if it's a tool that contributes to you know, 20 per cent plus of our fight against COVID, then it's a hugely valuable and important tool. And, and I, I describe it as our second line of defence. Our first line of defence is actually our own behaviour, the social distancing, wearing of face masks, washing of our hands. And uh, you know, the, the harsh reality is that that first line of defence and that second line of defence on their own have not been enough to prevent a second wave, which is, uh, and that is true across the whole of Europe, which is why we have to keep expanding our testing, improving our tracing, um, but also why we all have to comply with various restrictions as well. I'm just wondering whether one of the reasons may be that unfortunately the test and trace programme and other things haven't prevented us going into a second lockdown is because you and your organisation have been relentlessly pushed over the last six months to increase the volume of tests. And important though that is, 
that has stopped you looking hard enough at actually an equally important metric, which is the proportion of people actually complying when they're asked to quarantine? Um, I don't think it's an either or. Uh, we've been working across the end-to-end -end testing, tracing, isolating and supporting journey. And I'd say if you look over the course of the last five months, as you said, we've, we've increased testing capacity, which is the first step. If you haven't got the testing capacity, you can't work out who to isolate. So we've increased testing capacity faster than, than any other major country in Europe. So we've increased testing capacity fivefold since, um, since May. Germany's increased it three and a half times, Spain 2.3 times, Italy 2.2 times. So, so that is the first thing you have to do. Um, we've also been able to maintain our contact tracing rates while the volumes, as I said, have gone up, gone up 17 fold. And we've heard evidence this morning from other European countries who are having to suspend their contact tracing approach um, in the current second wave because they don't have this network of local and national. And then on supporting people in isolation over the course of the last five months, firstly, the government's allocated significant funding to local authorities. Uh, from the end of September into early October, uh, we have now got a £500 financial support payment for people who were unable to work uh, okay, on low income. Can I just income. ask you about that? Sorry to, to cut in, but um, Professor Harrison, uh, who gave us evidence earlier this morning, who's the Public Health Director at Blackburn and Darwin, yes. said that many people just can't afford to comply with the request to isolate, even with that £500 uh, support because if you're a taxi driver or, or on a zero hours contract it, it just isn't possible uh, to maintain your income at that level. Wouldn't people be more likely to comply if we had a system like we heard about in Germany where essentially the state reimburses any wages you lose? Well I, I do agree with Professor Harrison that all the evidence shows that people are not complying with isolation, not because they don't want to, but because they find it very difficult. And the, the, the need to, to keep earning and to be able to feed your family is a fundamental element of that, which is why I think that the financial support payments is a very good thing. Um, so I, um, I agree with the underlying driver. As to the actual sum of money, that, that is not for NHS Test and Trace. That is a decision for the government, um, for the Prime Minister and the Chancellor, and not one for me. OK, and final one from me, if I may. Um, this business about localised versus centralised systems, I, I just want to put to you, the evidence we heard this morning, again from Blackburn and Darwin, is that they're getting 89% of the uh, compliance rate uh, compared to 20% or maybe slightly higher compliance rate for the centralised system. And, and what they said is that it's basically local knowledge uh, down to a street level. It's knowledge particularly of ethnic minority communities that only a local council is able to have. Uh, what do you say to that? Um, might I just clarify what you mean by the 89% and the 20%? Because I think those might be apples and pears. You may be right, actually. He said that he... They're reaching, I think, 89% of the contacts. Yeah. Which so is that's the, the 89% is a combination of the national and local. So the, the and I, I, I think I, I was listening to Professor Harrison's evidence. I think he acknowledged this is a team effort. So the, the percentage of, of contacts in Blackburn and Darwin reached, you'll find the majority of that 89% are reached digitally, actually. The, sing, the largest contribution will be people self-serving. Um, then the second largest contribution will be the, the national team supporting Blackburn and Darwin, and then the local team in Blackburn and Darwin are reaching the people who may be hardest to hear, hardest to find, least willing to talk to someone from a national phone number. Um, so it's a proper team effort to get to the 89%, which is why I think that's the right model. The 20% the compliance, uh, I, I think, is a, different, is a different number altogether. So I'm really convinced that the right answer is this team of teams that is locally led, um, exactly as Professor Harrison said. It's the local knowledge of how people live their lives in each of our communities across the country. But if we only do that, we don't have the, firstly, we don't have the digital platform to enable those of us that will quite happily take the instruction and, and give our contacts electronically. And secondly, we don't have the surge capability, which is exactly what other countries that have only got local contact tracing are finding. Because the, we've talked a lot about the asymptomatic transmission of the disease, the other unusual and really difficult part of COVID is that it tends to form in clusters. 
So we don't see a uniform uh, infection rate across the country. And if we had resource teams that were solely local, we would find it very hard to surge and support communities like Blackburn, Oldham and others that have had a really tough time through the course of the summer and have needed that extra support. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Carol Monaghan. Thank you, Chair. Um, Baroness Harding, you've talked about contact tracing as one of the tools. And of course, one of the other tools that we have at our disposal is the um, Test and Protect app, which I understand your own husband has been informed over the last 24 hours of the need to self-isolate. But um, why were the settings of this app not at the correct level, or the privacy settings not at the correct level for the first six or seven weeks the app was in use? Um, so, firstly, yes, indeed, my husband has been asked to, to self-isolate by the app, and Julie is. So uh, we as a family are living exactly what this means right now. Um, in, in terms of the app, so uh, could I separate the... You, you refer to privacy settings. There, there was nothing wrong with the privacy settings of the app at all. We've not changed the privacy settings from the, 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 the version at release and the recent update of a couple of weeks ago. What we have done is improve the accuracy of the contact tracing component of the app. And that's through a combination of work that Google and Apple have done to improve. They released a new version of their API and also the work that our team have done together with the Turing Institute, bringing in infectiousness into the calculations. So the, the new version of the app is more accurate at assessing whether or not you have been at high risk of infection. It, nothing has changed in our focus on protecting people's privacy with the app. It was launched with, with privacy absolutely at the, uh, the, at the focal point. And actually, as my husband said to me yesterday, but I don't know who I was close to. And I said, yes, I know that is exactly the point of the app that it is privacy protecting. Carol? Okay, but what about the infectiousness settings then? When, why were they not at the appropriate level to start with? No, this is more about um, the scientific community learning and continuing to refine. So the Google Apple API was updated between us launching and the, the new release, and that's been a global... But, but, but Baroness Harding, I po sorry to interrupt, but Scotland and Northern Ireland both had their app um, working appropriately and England was struggling. What was the problem? Okay, I, I'm afraid I'm not aware of when Scotland upgraded to the new Google Apple API, which went live after you launched the Scottish app. Um, so I, I, it would be unfair of me to comment on the, the, the Scottish app. Uh, I suspect you're much more knowledgeable about that than I am. Um, in terms of the English app, um, the English and Welsh app has an integrated both contact tracing and venue check-in functionality that we worked with the team who developed the New Zealand app that's been very successful. So there is broader functionality in the English and Welsh app. Um, we all learned from each other. We went live last week together with Scotland and Northern Ireland with interoperability between our respective apps. Um, but we're also extremely proud of what we've done in the English and Welsh app, which has had much higher take up than any other app in the world. Over 40% of the eligible population in England now using the NHS COVID-19 app. Okay, um, if I could take you back to August then, what, what prevented the testing capacity meeting um, from meeting demand in August? So in, at the end of July, we published our business plan for NHS Test and Trace and committed to expand testing capacity to 500,000 tests a day by the end of October. Um, we, um, as I actually gave evidence to the Science and Technology Committee six, eight weeks ago, described how we had built those assumptions. Um, and what happened, not so much in August as in September, the first couple of weeks in September, as schools came back, we saw demand significantly outstrip that planned capacity delivery. Uh, so, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, um, could we have built testing capacity faster? Well, I'm not actually sure that anyone could. The, the reality is, as you know, in, in Scotland, you saw the same peak of demand for, for testing in Scotland as schools came back. Um, and uh, none of us were able to predict that in advance. 
And um, we were moving as fast as a team was capable of doing through the summer to expand that testing capacity. And as I've said, we've expanded testing capacity faster than any of our major comparator countries in Europe. Um, and the good news is, as we stand now, testing is completely unconstrained across all, all four nations. Anyone who wants to get a test anywhere across the country can get one today. And because we've also expanded the footprint of testing, there are over 600 sites across the country now. Um, the average distance people have to travel in England is now below three miles. And just remember, this is a, a retail network that didn't exist six months ago, that is now larger than the whole of Asda's food business, um, that has been around for considerably longer than that. Um, I think, I mean, the, the Chair has already congratulated you on the, the number of tests now been done, but you've repeated what you said to the Science and Technology Committee back in September, that nobody was expecting to see the, the increase when schools went back. How was that possible? Well, I think the, how, the reality is that we are all learning about COVID. We're learning about how the disease behaves and we're learning about how all of us as human beings and as society behave. And we're seeing that learning happening in real time across the whole world. And what we're trying to do in NHS Test and Trace with Public Health England is react as fast as we possibly can. And, and I hope what you can see is that system has reacted incredibly fast. And we now have more capacity than demand. We went live last week with GPs across the country now able to order tests as well so we're continuing to make it easier and easier for people to access testing and and that's something for us to be sort of hopeful and optimistic about as new testing technologies come on stream we are learning in Liverpool and with directors of public health across the country how to encourage more people to come forward for testing making it ever easier to find um, people who have the disease but don't know it. Okay, if I could ask my final question, because you've, you've said that you were not able to anticipate that when millions of school children and students went back into schools and university settings that there was going to be an increase in demand. I think many of us would find that difficult to understand. But I'm going to ask you then, when do you anticipate the next major demand for testing is going to be? Firstly, that's not quite what I said, I'm afraid. What I said was that we had anticipated significant increase in demand and we were building from circa 100,000 testing capacity at the beginning of May to 500,000 by the end of October. So we absolutely but had you predicted... You said to committee, you said, I do not think anybody was expecting to see the really sizable increase in demand that we have seen over the yeah. last few weeks. I said that we, were, we, we did not anticipate the, the exact amount, correct, but we were expecting demand to grow and we were growing capacity faster than any other European country to meet it. At, it with the benefit of hindsight, um, the, the balance between supply and the demand forecast wasn't right. Clearly that's true. But what you've also seen in the last six weeks is that we've met our commitments to get that supply and demand in, in, into balance. It, you ask me in terms of, of looking forward, and uh, as I said, uh, armed only with my crystal ball, all of us are, are working so hard with um, experts in, um, in, in science, in medicine, in um, behavioural science to understand what may happen as we go forward. And, and I wouldn't pretend to be one of those experts. We draw on all of them in order to build our forecasts. I, I think the thing that we've learnt all of us, is that um, more and more testing is a hugely valuable resource. Uh, and actually, we're now at a place where testing capacity isn't the constraint. And, and I'll, I'll hand over to Susan to, to maybe share her views on what she thinks um, we will see, how we will see the disease progress. But from a testing capacity perspective, um, we will continue to expand our PCR, our very high specificity and high sensitivity testing capacity. But we will also now be learning how to deploy rapid turnaround lateral flow tests and lamp testing, where capacity really isn't the constraint at all. Um, that there are millions of these to be deployed. The question is how to work through the use cases that make them fit with the way we live our lives. Baroness Harding, I'm sorry to take you back to my question. My question was when do you anticipate a next de 
large demand for tasting? Is it at Christmas time? Is it in springtime? When do, okay. we, when do we anticipate there will be this need? And I was going to suggest you might want to ask Su Dr well, Susan Hopkins for her well, view, because in the end this is about a view on where we think the disease will progress, rather than an well, operational... It's about, planning. Or... It's, it's yes. about planning how we're going to tackle it as well. Yes, indeed. Do you, do you have a view, Baroness Harding, before we go to Dr Hopkins? As I say, I, my view is that we need to keep expanding testing capacity significantly and sub substantially. And, and I think there are a number of different... That's Carol's question. Is there a particular um, time I, that you're looking forward at to anticipate a need for a search? No. I, I, honestly, I defer to the clinical experts in that rather than think that it is my job to know the answer to that question. Very briefly, Dr Hopkins. So we know that as we go through the winter, we see increased demand um, for testing because of increased amounts of colds, flus and winter illnesses, a lot of which mimic and are very similar to the symptoms of coronavirus. Um, previous modelling estimates that we would need 500,000 tests a day in December, so we're ahead of that, but I have no doubt this season it is likely to be more, which is why we're uh, ramping up and rolling out lateral flow devices and LAMP to give that extra capacity to the system. Uh, with uh, you know additional capacity going to the health and care centre as a uh, sector as a priority, but also with directors of public health being offered large amounts of tests every week to deploy in their local sessions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank um, you, Chair. Thank you. We'll go to Dawn Butler. But one thing, uh, Baroness Harding, that you said to Carol Monaghan was that uh, anyone can now get a test. Yes. Um, so is that the case that if people are told to self-isolate because they've been in contact with someone with a positive case or perhaps instructed by the app, but they don't have any symptoms, can they now get a test? Um, they shouldn't get a test in order to release them from that isolation. What I meant when I said anyone can get a test is that if you have symptoms and you need a test, you can get one. There are no, there are no testing constraints. So it's still the, the case that only those with symptoms are out to get Yes, tested. that's not because of testing capacity. That's because of the clinical advice on what contacts should do. So if you are a contact of somebody who has tested positive, you are highly likely to become infectious, and the clinical advice is that you should self-isolate for 14 days. Even if you test negative during that 14-day period, the, the current clinical advice is that you should continue to self-isolate. Okay, but you've got, um, you've got the capacity to test such people. You That's may have correct. heard from Sir John Bell, who's That's the Regents Professor of Medicine at Oxford, uh, who thinks that not only is it possible, but it's important that people who have been instructed to isolate should be able to get a test. You're telling us that you've got that capacity, but you're not allowed to use it. So what we're currently doing, working with Sir John and, and others, is piloting um, the use of the new rapid lateral flow tests with a number of use cases. Sure, but you've got and, the capacity in your and, own system. Then. Yes, and one of those use cases is to test people regularly during that period of isolation in order to determine if it's possible to release people from their isolation because they have te their test it being tested regularly. But at the current clinical advice I'm operating under is that, and all of us are in the country, is that if we're identified as a contact, we need to isolate for 14 days. Are you making full use of the 500,000 a day testing capacity? Um, yes, we're currently operating at, and actually it's more than 500,000 as we speak and growing, but uh, we, we aim to operate between sort of 70 and 80% capacity utilisation in order to be able to deliver improving turnaround times. No factory would ever want to operate at 100% capacity utilisation 24-7, which you know, actually six weeks ago was exactly where we were having to operate to so meet that's demand. The optimal, so we are, uh, on average, we are. Um, the one thing I would say is we tend to operate at lower than that at the weekends. Um, so we do have, we do have um, spare capacity at the weekends, and we did have, if you look back through the data, through half term, we saw fewer people coming forward for testing and operated at less than our target 70% for a few days during half term. Thank you. John Butler, and then Paul Bristol. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, um, Baroness Harding, for attending the committee. Um, at your last um, uh, attendance, I, I wrote you a letter on the 25th of September um, I haven't yet had a response, so I'm just going to ask a few questions from that letter, if you don't mind. I'm sure it won't come as a surprise. Um, but picking up on um, the last bit of evidence that you just gave in regards to capacity for testing, um, in order to close the loop of your test and trace system, um, isn't it important that those people who are asked to isolate... Oh, 
We've lost your sound, Dawn. She looks like she's frozen. Um, I think you're... Ever they ask it to my heart? Oh, um, we can hear you again. Try, try again now, Dawn. Try now. Sorry, I may have frozen then. Yes, you did. Um, ask a question again, Dawn. Um, in order to close the system in regards to the test and trace system, is it not important that those people who are asked to isolate to self-isolate, that they are testing in order so you can understand how your test and trace system is working. So whether they are um, asymptomatic or not, should they not also be tested? Um, I, I, if, it, if it is all right, I think that um, the best person to answer that question is actually Susan as a clinician. Um, as I said, we are currently running pilots exploring exactly that, but operate under the clinical advice that at the moment it's important that people uh, isolate for the full period of time. And there are, um, the danger of course is if we receive a negative test on day three of isolation, we're tempted to think that we're free of the disease and we break that isolation. So there, there are downsides of testing as well as upsides during that period. But maybe I could Dr. refer Hopkins, to my-, my you, uh, Briefly if you would, because we've got a lot of colleagues that want to ask yeah. questions. Of course. So uh, I think we're looking at a variety of approaches at the moment. And the first thing to do in looking at these approaches is both to model the approach. And we have asked SPIAM to look at various as aspects of modeling, short duration periods, short durations with testing on a single day or short durations with testing on multiple days. We will then test those in the field because actually uh, this is new and novel and this is not being done globally. So we cannot learn from other global partners. Uh, and I think we are also working very closely with uh, uh, Matt Ashton, who's the Director of Public Health in Liverpool, where we have introduced mass testing and where we're looking to see both in schools um, and as part of their contact tracing, how we can introduce testing and what impact that has on the population coming forward for testing, but also on the impact on isolation. Thank you. Dawn Butler. Sorry. Thank you very much. Um, Bernice Harding, um, Professor Ann Johnson earlier spoke about the leaky system. Um, part of the leaky system are those tests that are voided. Can you tell the committee how many tests are um, actually voided at the moment? on average? We monitor the, the voids. As you say, it's very important. We monitor it on a daily basis. Uh, it varies. This is a large operational system, but it ranges between 1% and 3% on a daily basis. The primary reason um, that tests are voided are um, some element of the, the kit has broken or not um, made it through to the laboratory intact. Thank you. Dawn? Confirm whether the voided tests. I ask you a question again, Dawn. You froze again. Can you? So, oh my goodness, sorry. Can you confirm whether the public is being charged for these voided tests? Well, test and trace is a free NHS service, so no one is being charged. Um, uh, for their test. The, the costs of processing the tests, um, obviously the tests have to be processed whether or not there is a result or not. Um, for a lot of the voids, they will be voided early on in the testing laboratory process and therefore won't incur all of the costs. Thank you. Um, the Treasury documents in July reveal that the government originally allocated £10 billion for the test and trace system. Um, however, during the Chancellor's winter uh, economic plan, he, he gave the figure of £12 billion. Can you explain the £2 billion pounds overspent, please? It's simply a function of our growing desire to expand testing capacity. As I said, circa 80% of the test and trace budget is testing. That percentage is growing as our ambitions to increase testing capacity grow. And the, the £2 billion additional um, was entirely to do with testing. Uh, as in, sorry, just in layman's terms, what is the two billion pounds being spent on okay. actually testing people? Or so expanding the testing capacity of our PCR testing network. Um, so we've announced a number of laboratories that are coming on stream in Newcastle, in Charnwood, 
um, and in Berkshire over the course of the next few months. So we will go beyond our 500,000 um, per day capacity target. So it, it includes that. And then the other major increment is the, um, the, the development and then purchasing of lateral flow and lamp testing equipment, which is now giving us the potential to pilot whole city population testing in Liverpool. Okay. Um, what advantage is there in employing external consultants to work in public health roles? Um, well, if I might answer that question in the context, rather than theoretically, but in the context of what we're doing in Test and Trace, if that's all right. Uh, uh -huh. We stood this service up um, in May at extraordinary speed. As I say, we've built something that is the same size as ASDA in the course of five months. And when you start something very quickly, you need to pull on all of the talents across all of society. So when we first started, we had significant resource come from the military, from the civil service, um, but all, uh, from the NHS, and also from the private sector. And when you don't know what you're building, you can't offer people permanent jobs when you don't yet have a permanent organisation. So you have to employ people either as independent individual consultants or through consultancy organisations. And that's one of the important components of building the system. And, you know, we've built something really with the talents across yeah. society. John, final question? Absolutely. So, sorry, sorry to disturb you. Um, I agree, but I just think, could civil servants not have done that, that job rather than um, employing uh, external consultants? And Byline Times recently revealed that outsourcing giant capital was paid £1,800 a day to supply senior staff. That's the equivalent of half a million pounds uh, a year when a civil servant could have done that job. Do you think that's actually value for money, Baroness Harding? We need both. So we've got fabulous civil servants who've been working every hour that, that they have on Test and Trace. But to stand a service up at this speed, we've needed to call on the talents across the whole of society, both public sector and private sector. As the organisation becomes more established and more permanent, we're able to offer people more long-term permanent jobs, and we're seeing the proportion of civil servants grow. Um, but you know, the, the, the teams from the military, from Deloitte, from other consultants, consultancies have done extraordinary work together with our brilliant civil servants and NHS colleagues and I'm really proud to be representing all of them. And my last question, um, Chair, um, the government's uh, moonshot plan, which they were going to invest £100 billion in, has now essentially been delivered by local authorities through this mass testing programme. Do you now think it is time that local authorities are now given the extra resources instead of the money going to private companies such as GSK, AstraZeneca, Serco, Randox, G4S. At the end of the day, the local authorities are now doing the job. Should they now not get the finance? As I think you heard from Professor Harrison, and I know you would hear from the team in Liverpool as well, this is a team of teams. We need all of them. This fight against COVID can't be won single-handedly by any of us. So the only way that we've been able to deliver this mass um, population testing pilot in Liverpool is by working with private sector technology companies who have developed the lateral flow tests themselves, um, with the military who've been helping with the logistics, with consulting firms who've designed the testing sites, with the local authority who've staffed them so completely brilliantly and engaged their community. We need all of them. I don't think we can choose one or the other. The only way we'll fight COVID is together. Okay. Thank you. But very why, much. why are you paying? Sorry, Chair. Just one. We do need all of them. But why are you paying one sector a hell of a lot more than the other? Is the is the rates um, right for the job? Um, well, I think the important thing is that we are paying, we are procuring things professionally and efficiently, which I believe we are. It's it's a public Absolutely service. Not. Are you getting a are you getting a discount that uh, reflects the contribution to public service? As I say, we procure through um, the government procurement service. I have a chief commercial officer from the government's commercial team in the cabinet office, and we benefit from all rates that government has negotiated with the private sector as part of the COVID uh, fight. Do they reflect rates that um, are consistent with a national emergency? Well, as I say, they're, they're the government's rates rather than the test and trace rates. All right. Uh, Paul Bristow and then Barbara Keeley. 
Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Prof Professor Harding, for uh, your evidence so far. Uh, I want to deal with some of the things that have been said, perhaps fairly or unfairly, about how the operation of NHS testing trace and uh, the national contact tracers. Um, an article appeared in The Guardian on NHS test and trace that claims uh, public sector clinicians are being replaced with unqualified private sector workers on minimum wage and outsourcing means that teenagers are operating crucial parts of England's uh, test and trace system. Is this unfair and what would you say about the training and the qualifications of those who are doing the national tracing? Um. I think it's incredibly unfair on the thousands of people from NHS professionals, from working as part of Circo and CITAL and in all of our local authorities who are working together to deliver our contact tracing service. I'm incredibly proud to represent all of them. Uh, and, and as I keep uh, sort of coming back to, this is a team of all the talents. So uh, we have been able to expand our approach to contact tracing. As I say, we contacted 17 times more people last week than we did at the beginning of August, precisely because we've been able to surge capacity across all of these different teams. Um, we have been um, taking some of our most experienced um, teams who contact, sorry, too many contacts in each of my sentence, T teams who, who call um, contacts rather than cases, that some of the most experienced agents who do that have been doing non-clinical work at what we call tier two, contacting people who have, um, have tested positive. And we've been doing that in order to meet the extraordinary increase in demand for contact tracing. And um, we're seeing very, very good feedback. We, we survey, Briefly, you would, uh, sorry, service. we do get customer feedback from people who've been reached by test and trace and over 80% of them say that they have been extremely well supported. Thank you. We've got lots of questions to come, so if we could keep um, uh, answers brief, I'd be grateful. Paul Brister. Um, well, that's, um, that's very reassuring, Professor Harding. Uh, the main charge here is that a, a centralised approach was wrong and that tracing should have been put under local public health directors. And more local tracing is now... Uh, it, now more local tracing has been taken. That's um, retrospective proof that this was correct. Um, would you say that was misleading? Oh, well, yes, and I started on the 5th of May, and one of the very first things I did was to appoint Tom Reardon, the Chief Executive of Leeds City Council, to lead our, at that point, tracing and containment team, and worked with Tom through the summer, and now his successor, Carolyn Wilkins, the Chief Executive of Oldham City Council. I really firmly believe, and have believed from the beginning, that this needs to be a local and national partnership, and that's what we're building, and I think you're seeing that that's delivering in a way that's solely local or solely national systems aren't and thank you for the compliment but I'm not a professor wouldn't want to masquerade as one Paul. Oh, okay. okay that's um, that, that's fine Baron's hiding and uh, that's my questions over, over thank you very much indeed uh, Barbara Keeley then Erin Bell then um, Neil Hanley Thank you. Well, I've got questions on, on two different areas, and I might take a different view to, to the one that Paul Bristol has just taken. Um, the first is on contact tracing performance. I wanted you to take, take you back to what you said to the chair of the Health Select Committee earlier. You said no person can reach someone if they don't have their contact details. We're talking about teams who have the contact details from the test results. So you have their test result. You have the name, address, and postcode, and lots of other information and data about them. Now, it, it just seemed to me hearing you say that, that that's an absolute argument for local contact tracing because they could contact them. What, what has happened in, in the areas of some of the worst outbreaks is that, is that they've actually gone round and knocked on the door of people that they couldn't reach. So is, is not your argument that, that a failure to reach the top 30, 40, 50% of, 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 of contacts is actually because you're not local. So if we go back to what Professor Dominic Harrison said about people with a local understanding, they understand where the outbreaks are, you know, which are the areas more likely to have uh, disadvantaged uh, areas and, and uh, the culture and languages. So it, shouldn't we really be arguing, based on what you said, for a low so surge capacity? Because I think all you said uh, to justify having any national capacity is a surge capacity, and you could have that locally. Um, two points I'd like to make. Firstly, just to clarify, anyone who tests positive 
is automatically reached by us because we send them the message that they've tested positive. Uh, we're pretty hard on ourselves in the English system. We only count as someone who has been reached for contact tracing if they have then responded to that message saying they've tested positive and come back to us. The Scottish system, for example, once they've sent an email informing someone to isolate, they count that as a contact, so as a successful contact. So we set a very high bar for whether or not we've had engagement with those people who've tested positive. Uh, uh, secondly, to your point, actually I do agree with you that the, the, the description of where local contact tracing absolutely is its strongest is when we don't have details for people and you have local knowledge, but you don't want to build a contact tracing system that is solely dependent on knocking on doors. We need to take, no. A, no. The, the surge capacity is a very, very large proportion of the, of the contact tracing at the moment because of the scale of the ep epidemic, and we want our brilliant local teams focused on knocking on the doors of the smaller number of people that only they can reach. That's why it's a local and a national combo. Thank you. Barbara? Okay, but, but I, I just come back to the question of resources. We heard earlier from Professor Harrison that in Blackburn with Darwin, where they've had very high case levels, he had a team of 20 people tracing contacts, achieving 87% contacts reached. That's a very good result from them. Um, he also said that if, if he had 100 people, he could achieve so much more. Why do we deploy this resource nationally when you're saying that there are people that they can't reach? They can't reach, they don't understand the area, they don't understand the culture, they don't understand the language. That's, that's what's really wrong with this. Can I just be clear, the 87% that is being reached in, in Blackburn with Darwin is a combination of the national and the local, and the majority of those 87% are but you're being not reached reaching. by the national no. teams. You're not, the figures show that you're not. The, it, I mean, it's, it's very important, clearly, when he was talking about this, this super output there are outbreaks, having that understanding of the, of the families and the, the way, uh, you know, that uh, any community is organised. I, I think, I mean, we could, we could leave you because obviously, oh, going to... We've lost your sound, Barbara. Clearly led and locally resourced. Um, my other question is about the mass testing pilots. Um, I, and the confusion about the messaging around mass testing uh, with the rapid test, the point of care tests. Uh, w what we've seen since early September is, is a, a real confusion in messaging. The, the Prime Minister uh, talked about millions of tests being processed and the level of tests would allow people to lead more normal lives. You, Baroness Harding, said to the CBI that this the rapid testing might be a normal cost of doing business to allow non-socially distance activities. That has actually built up this mass testing pilot to a point where people think that if, if, if we have this testing, we'll be able to go back to crowds, go back to non-social distancing. But our last panel of witnesses talked about not being at that point with mass testing. We're not able to allow people to test negative in mass testing, then to be part of crowded events. So, you know, clearly, we need, I understand we need an enablement strategy going forward. We don't have it yet. So can you clarify the strategy around the use of mass testing and rapid testing? And do you believe that you and others should be more cautious in saying um, it will allow people to be part of crowds and then non-socially distanced? Well, uh, I was up in Liverpool on Sunday with the team in Liverpool um, in some of the testing sites, and, and I do think that these new very fast turnaround tests offer real opportunity for us to find more people who've got the disease but don't realise it and are inadvertently spreading it. So I do think that we should be hopeful that mass testing op offers us another tool in the toolkit um, that's but not it's what not I asked you. With, 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 with respect, that's not what I asked you. I asked you that we've got a confusion in messaging. You have been part of causing that confusion in messaging alongside the Prime Minister. I asked you to clarify the strategy and ask you, do you believe that talking back in September in the way you did um, about uh, you know, the, uh, the, the cost of business will include rapid testing and people will be able to go about non-socially distance activities, that has caused massive confusion. Well, I, I'm, I'm area, sorry, I was attempting... I yeah, was okay. attempting to answer your question by saying what I think my view is on mass testing. And um, to be clear, I spoke to the CBI last week. So it wasn't a confusion in September because the lateral flow tests didn't exist at that stage. 
we are at the very early stages of learning how mass testing will work. We have a number of different pilots with universities, with De Montfort University and with Durham, as Sir John Bell described. Um, we yesterday announced um, working with 50 directors of public health, where we've dispatched this week 500,000 lateral flow tests to them for them to pilot using those tests in their community. So, for example, using those tests to see if they can enable Enable people to visit their loved ones in care homes. I think it is important that we see this technology as the potential to give us more of our lives back. But it isn't a silver bullet, it isn't the single solution, and it never was, and I, I'm certain I have never given that impression. Thank you very much. Uh, just, to, just to say, a, uh, just a, a final point then, Finally, I, th Robert, I think there is some, yes, a final, <laughs> very final point, that I think all of us as members of parliament get um, correspondence from people who don't believe in this fight against the lockdown, fight against the restrictions. Just to say to you that I think that confusion around messaging just makes that problem worse with members of parliament. It makes it worse because people don't want to be restricted. They don't want to not see their families. And every time somebody like yourself rolls out that sort of comment, oh, business could buy these tests and it could be a way of non-socially distanced, then it just causes more confusion. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, just to clarify um, a, a question that Barbara asked you, Baroness uh, Harding, do you dispute the the notion that local test and trace um, teams have a higher record of successfully contacting um, contacts than the national team? No, not at all. The, 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 I was simply challenging the 87% statistic is the combined success of the local and national contact tracing. 87% of the proportion of total contacts reached in Blackburn with Darwin, of which that is digital, national and local. It is the case, is it not, that um, over the last five months that the proportion of contacts reached and asked to self-isolate uh, has been uh, nearly 100% for local teams compared to between 50 and 60% for the national team. <coughs> Um, and those, yes, those percentages have remained remark relatively static. The, the volumes are very different, though. So that's why I think it's important that we have a national and a local system, because the, the, the local teams, and um, they have so much more local knowledge, as we keep saying, they have access to more information, and is, uh, uh, as we just hear, heard, can go and knock on people's doors. But that is not something you can do for 80% of the, of the people contacted, certainly at this scale of, of infection. So you need both. It's not an either or. But when you've got that disparity uh, in performance and success rates and you've got the local directors of public health telling you they can do more, why would you well, not have uh, we are that? We are working really hard. We have 150 local authorities working with us on local contact tracing partnerships as we speak and another 150 are about to go live. <coughs> and we're really keen to experiment and pilot with all of those local authorities to do more and more. We do see case flow Pilots. come the other way as well. Six months into the virus we're piloting these schemes? Well, we're learning all the time. I think that's entirely appropriate. Um, I we, to could I just 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 clarify? Briefly. We do see cases come the other way as well. So um, when you see a large outbreak in a particular geography, um, because you have, a, a, however large the team, a finite amount of, of people in one local geography, we do, as part of our partnership, local authority contact tracers send cases back to the central teams as well. We work genuinely in partnership to make sure that together we reach as many people as possible. Thank you very much. Aaron Bell. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Baroness Harding, for your evidence today. Can I go back to isolation? Um, you've, you've made clear that the isolation policy is a clinical decision. To what extent do you consider isolation monitoring part of the responsibility of the test and trace service? So we have been uh, and do have a role to play in, I would say, rather than monitoring, supporting isolation. So part of our contact tracer's role is to point anybody asked to isolate to the support that they will re are able to receive from their local authority, right, either digitally or giving them phone numbers. We have also, since uh, we went live with the financial support payments and the change in the law to make it mandatory to isolate, we have uh, commenced contacting people during their isolation period. We, in advance of the, the legal change, we piloted different approaches to 
understand what people found was most helpful and supportive and likely to encourage them to continue isolating. So we trialled texting, emailing and calling, and we call people three times now during their isolation period to check that they've got the support they need and to remind them of their responsibilities. And, and, that's, and that's everybody, that's not just a sample? Or... No, we know that we've now rolled that out. Okay. Uh, you gave us a 54% figure of people who haven't left home during their isolation area. Yes. Um, you said it wasn't uh, QA, but is that people who've been asked to isolate because they're a contact, or is it based on people who had positive tests? And is there a difference between the two? Because it strikes me that there would be. The, the 50, as you say, the un-QA'd 54% is a combination of the two. I'm very keen to be able to publish this mm -hmm. as, as soon as possible, for, as we are all learning. And as I say, I'd, I'd refer you back again to the Chief Medical Officer's uh, yes. advice that we shouldn't think of this as a binary, you do or you don't. No, I, I understand that, and Professor Witty was very clear about that with us last week. But is there a difference between people who are contacts and people who are tested positive? I haven't got the data to prove it one way or the other, though sort of instinct would suggest that if you know that you've got the disease, you are more likely to be cautious. Um, but as I say, that's only instinct. I don't know if um, Professor Hopkins has got more data than I have on that. Professor Hopkins? I, I don't have any more data. Thank you. Um, could, I, could I ask that you look at that 54% where that's come from and ask people to break down the data like that? Because I think that really speaks to the concerns that John Bell raised uh, in our previous panel. And he also raised a point that I wanted to ask you about, that people, especially students, are not engaging with tests because they fear they and their friends may be asked to isolate. And I've heard on uh, calls with other MPs, people turning up to the test centre and then turning round uh, once they've realised that if they get a positive test, they might have to isolate. Are you concerned that people are not engaging with the system at all because of the requirements of isolation? And the reality is no technology is going to change the fact that if you've tested positive, you're infectious and you must isolate. Right. Um, so, and, and I think people are really understand that and we're seeing that as you know, ever more people come forward for, for testing. I do understand the, the challenges of being asked to isolate if you don't have, the, have any symptoms and you don't know if you're infectious. And, and um, hence, as... As, Do as Professor Hopkins and Sir John described, the modelling and the piloting being done to see if it is possible to use these rapid turnaround tests to check every day whether you are or are not infectious um, as a contact. We will learn a huge amount about that, I'd have thought, in very short, rapid time as we start piloting these tests. And in terms of that suggestion about potentially releasing people from quarantine via rapid testing, are you currently resourced to do that uh, with the, the number of people you've got who can arrange these tests and make sure people are tested every other day or would it be something people would do for themselves? Um, well, we, as, as you see us rolling out, literally as we speak, you know, announcing yesterday rolling out to, to, to 50 local authorities with lateral flow tests with the pilot that is ongoing in Liverpool, we are resourcing to support a very wide variety of pilots. Uh, at the moment, the lateral flow tests need to be um, administered by a professional. So you, you take the swab yourself, but then the um, processing that takes a very short period of time is done by a trained professional. Um, clearly, if it is possible to make those tests entirely self-administered, that opens up another opportunity for us as a society. But at this stage, that's not the case. And just going back to my previous question about people perhaps not engaging with the system because their friends may have to isolate. Do you have figures for people who book and don't turn up to tests? I, I do. I don't have them in the back of my head. Um, they've remained, I think, from memory, reasonably constant through the last six months as testing has ramped up. Um, but I can write to the committee and share the data that we have. Thank you. Uh, yeah, with that, and if you can do any more on that 54% uh, breakdown, that would be great. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much indeed. I'm going to come to Neil Hanvey, Dean Russell, Zara Sultana and Laura Trott. But I'm going to bring in Graham Stringer now because he's got a question in the chamber that he needs to, to leave for. Graham Stringer. But Baroness Harley, I was surprised and shocked really at your failure to answer two questions. One to Carol about uh, when you expected a, a, a large increase in, in infections. Because you're the executive chair of the National Institute of Health Protection. I would have expected you to have asked that question of professionals before and to have a, an answer. Uh, f for this committee. And then secondly, that your failure to have 
an answer between the balance of resources going into uh, local public health protection and national. <coughs> that is the crux of the debate about test and trace, whether uh, doing things locally is more effective than, than centrally. Why don't you have an answer to those two questions? If I just take each of those, um, uh, on uh, the uh, in future view on infections, I was simply, as we have test and trace as chief medical advisor on the call uh, in this hearing, deferring to my medical expert. I think my personal view of how the future of the virus will unfold is a lot less re relevant than the it clinical wasn't experts. A personal that view. Was I would have expected you to have asked that, so you would have had a okay. view well. having asked the professionals as the executive chair of an organisation. I was just That's explaining why I was deferring to my expert. Um, in terms of local authority funding, that is not the jurisdiction of NHS Test and Trace. And as you heard from Professor Harrison earlier, local authorities are using a wide variety of their teams to support their contact tracing efforts, and those are not costs that are available to me. So I was just simply being straightforward about the, the data that is in my direct control and which isn't. No, but in terms of coming to a conclusion about whether it is better to have public health teams more resource and less resources at the centre, if you want to be effective, you surely should have an answer to that question which you have given very generalised answers about working together. Well, fine, we all want to work together, but it makes a difference whether that's 90% of local or 90% of the centre. I would have expected an answer to those questions. I'm, I'm sorry if you felt that I was being evasive. In terms of giving you an answer, uh, over the course of the last six months, we have moved uh, significant resource into local contact tracing, so the direction of travel is more local. Um, and I would expect it to continue to be more local. Um, but the scale of the virus as we currently stand is such that we need to have both. And so rather than shifting resource from one to the other, we, need to be, we have been enhancing local contact tracing while at the same time we've been scaling up national. Of course, we, simple as that. given the situation we're in, we need both. I would have thought it would have been useful uh, not to know the direction of travel, but to know where it was better to put uh, more resources. I spoke to uh, the Northwest Regional uh, Health uh, people week last uh, Friday, I think it was. They, were, they told me uh, that it was taking more than three days to get uh, test results back uh, for NHS staff, which if they were asymptomatic, those were the people being tested, that meant they were useless and could have been infecting people in hospitals. That, that speed is faster than in care homes. Why is it taking so long in these key areas? Um, so, uh, thank you for asking about, about testing turnaround times. I, I do agree that continuing to improve them is very important. So, as of last week, 62% of in-person tests were received the next day after taking a test. That's up from 46.5% the previous week. And for care homes last week, 58% of all tests were received back, test results were received back within 48 hours. Um, I would be the first to say that these need to continue to improve and the new testing technologies that are being rolled out in the NHS, both lateral flow and LAMP, um, enable turnaround times of less than an hour which will be hugely valuable for the NHS as they roll those out. So we should expect to see turnaround times continue to improve now that testing capacity and new technologies have grown. Just on that point before Graham continues, the targets that you've been given is in terms of 24-hour turnaround. That's the official target. What is the performance in, uh, against that metric? Um, let me give you that. I have them by different channels. Um, it, you're quite, as, as I'm sure you would be asking, they've got... Um, they're not as good. Right, so if we look at face-to-face um, -face channels, um, the 24-hour um, for 22nd to the 28th of October ranged between 35% and 19%, depending on which type of site you went to. Um, that has, um, in those cases, have also improved markedly from the previous week, um, from 28 to 35 and from 16 to 19%. And as I said, um, Mr Chairman, I know that these need to improve. Um, they have been improving week on week, every week for the last four weeks, as the testing capacity has come on stream. And we, as I said to your committee earlier in uh, last month, uh, we've prior we prioritised in September 
testing volumes over turnaround times because there was so much more demand than we had capacity. Now that we have more capacity, we are prioritising turnaround times. I was keen to know the, the, the comparable figures. Sorry, Graham, I interrupted you. Uh, you would accept that if it takes three days of, to get a result, a positive result back to somebody working in the NHS or five or six days to somebody working in a care home, it's next useless. That person could have infected vulnerable elderly people or patients in a, in a hospital. Would you expect that it's been a waste of money if you take that long to uh, return the tests? Well, just as, as I said yes, last week, just under 60% of our care home testing came back within 48 hours. Um, which is the best that we've done for some considerable time. Um, and no, I don't think it's a waste of money. If you look at the um, infection rates in care homes of both care home staff and residents, um, everyone is, is, is clearly a, a tragedy, any infection getting into any care home. But the care home infection rates are markedly lower as we go into the second wave than they were in February and March when we didn't have the regular testing program. So actually, I'd say the complete opposite. We've prioritised uh, testing of social care staff and residents over other use cases in order to make our care homes safer. And we're seeing factually that that is the case. So I think it's a hugely important use of scarce testing resource to be focused on on our residents in care homes and the, st the staff who care for them. I wasn't saying testing people in hospitals and care homes was a waste of time. I was saying actually it takes so long to get the tests back. People may well have been infected. Of course, uh, infections have come down from when untested people were sent back from hospitals because there are much better preventative uh, systems in both hospitals and, and care homes now. But the tests that don't come back in the right time are a waste of money, aren't they? Well, uh, we, we are continuing to improve turnaround times and with every improvement that makes the system work better and better. I, I don't agree that it's a... a um, not a good idea or a good idea based on a particular percentage. It's really important that we continue to test everybody working in social care and in the NHS. Nobody's saying we should stop. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Neil Hanley. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, uh, thank you, Baroness Harding. I, I want to go back very briefly to um, talk about uh, the capacity of test and trace. Um, this morning we heard from uh, Professor Sir Chris Ham, that the movement on testing over the summer was too slow and that left us behind the curve. Uh, and in July, the 21st of July this year, uh, when Professor Whitty um, appeared before the Health and Social Care Committee, um, I asked him about uh, ramping up uh, testing during the uh, summer lull, as it's turned out to be. And I just wonder if you can give us some idea of what your view is as to why that didn't happen and what the barriers were uh, to prevent that from happening. Well, I, I, I'm afraid I don't agree that the, there was a summer lull in test and trace. Um, our team were working flat out all the way through the summer to expand testing capacity. So, so I think um, um, perhaps Neil wants to clarify his yeah. question. Yeah. Sorry. Can I clarify? Uh, it's not a summer lull of testing. It was a summer lull of cases. Uh, so during that quieter time, why was that, uh, that the summer period not utilised to maximise the capacity of test and trace uh, so that we were ready for what was widely regarded uh, as a predictable uh, second wave. Uh, sorry for misunderstanding. Um, actually, that summer period was used to great effect to dramatically expand our testing capacity. So, as I said, between May and October, the UK expanded its testing capacity by 514%. That compares to Germany expanding by 351%, uh, Spain by 235%. And as we stand today, we do more tests per thousand um, than, uh, than Spain, Italy, Germany, Sweden, the Netherlands, Ireland, Austria, and Norway across Europe. And, and so I, I know that um, we would all like to be able to move even faster, but the team across Test and Trace scaled our testing capacity faster than any other comparable country in Europe. Neil? 
Uh, yes, thanks, Chair. Um, well, I, I, I appreciate uh, your response, but that doesn't uh, fit with the narrative of either Professor Whitty or indeed <coughs> Professor Ham this morning, because Professor Ham said that the movement was too slow, and in his evidence in July, Professor Whitty said that it that there wasn't it wasn't feasible to ramp up capacity until there was a second surge. So. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a consistency in the message that's being presented from the scientists and from yourself. Uh, I, I can't uh, understand why that would be the case. I'm sorry, I don't have the specific quote that you're referring to from Professor, Professor Whitty in July, so it's hard for me to comment on that. Um, we did publish our NHS test and trace business plan at the end of July that set out our determination to have testing capacity of 500,000 a day by the end of October and over 500 testing sites. So we did have that publicly stated ambition that we have delivered on. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a very quick quote from Professor Whitty from that uh, session. There is a danger, uh, oh, sorry, uh, from, we were so far away from where we needed to be across multiple different areas, the biggest limiting step was on testing. Without testing, there is no system, and our ability to ramp up testing was very significantly strained. Okay, I, I'm, I, I'm afraid it's hard for me to comment on someone else's discrete quote without knowing the, the context of the discussion. If we, what I can give you is my view, which I've is from, context. sorry. I've explained the context of the discussion. Sorry, I'm sorry, just to give a brief reaction uh, to that. Um, well, I, I guess I stand by what I said, which is um, there's no doubt that expanding testing capacity is an essential component in the fight against COVID, um, that we more than sort of almost any other country in Europe have scaled our testing capacity since the start of the uh, epidemic as fast as we possibly can. Okay. If I can move on uh, to, to my second point, which is um, the deployment of uh, the ANOVA test, um, the uh, um, lateral flow test, and its appropriateness. I know that on the data sheet that accompanies the test, um, it does state uh, that it, its uh, accuracy uh, for unsymptomatic or non-symptomatic uh, um, patients is limited and has not been thoroughly evaluated. Uh, I just want to know, is um, what, what's your thoughts on, uh, and those of, uh, of your medical advisor, what are your thoughts on the appropriateness of deploying that in Liverpool, given that limitation, and are the data uh, being collected uh, to analyse whether that has had any impact on the efficacy of uh, deploying that test uh, and implications thereof? Thank you. Quite a few questions there. Uh, briefly, perhaps um, Professor Hopkins. So, so I'm very happy to take that. Uh, I have been working with uh, Professor John Bell and others from Oxford University and colleagues in Port and Down to both laboratory validate and then clinically validate and evaluate these tests. Uh, the report, as John Bell mentioned this morning, uh, will be published tomorrow. Uh, and we are will be able to then share with you all of the full data that's within that. Uh, it does include testing on uh, and validating and piloting on symptomatic and asymptomatic individuals. Uh, and so we felt reassured with all of that data, which we had reviewed as an expert advisory group uh, and before the uh, Liverpool testing went ahead. I have shared that report and confidence with the Liverpool team uh, and hopefully it will get published and then there will be a clarity in, in moving forward. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Dean Russell, then Zara Sultana, and then Laura Trot. Thank you, Chair. And um, Baroness Harding, can I extend my thanks to the uh, team that's uh, been building up this uh, test and trace system over the past few months? It's been uh, absolutely unprecedented. Um, my question is related to uh, engagement with directors of public health. I'm very, very fortunate in Hertfordshire. I've got a fantastic director of public health, Jim McManus, who I speak to on a very regular basis. Uh, but one of the questions I've got related to that is, is what's the strategy and how regularly do you engage with directors of public health um, to, to get their feedback and to listen to their learnings on the ground? 
um, very regularly. As I said, I was in Liverpool with Matt Ashton, the Director of Public Health, on Sunday, and um, Susan, who maybe should come in to, to talk more about the work that she and Carolyn Wilkins, who works for me and leads our, our contain team, do, uh, are doing to make sure that we really embed the wisdom and experience and advice of our directors of public health in everything we're doing. Susan led a, a large session um, at the end of last week, which maybe would be useful to, for the committee to hear about. Will you speak, Professor Hopkins? Yeah, we, uh, we ran a workshop uh, particularly looking at what we wanted from the future jointly with local government uh, directors of public health, public health England teams and Test and Trace. And we're going to use the learning from that workshop to work together with the new director of Trace, uh, Steve McManus, who is a nurse by background and chief exec of uh, Royal Berkshire, to try and ensure that we implement the best way forward for this. Um, I have a weekly call with the uh, presidents of the academy and, and, uh, and colleges, including uh, the Faculty of Public Health, uh, and engage with them regularly, and also regularly join a phone a call, a call, a telephone call with the Association for the Directors of Public Health. All of them know they reach out, can reach out to me regularly, and they do, both by email and telephone contact. Uh, and we continue to have very good directors, ex-directors of public health embedded across the test and trace team. Thank you, Dean. And can I ask, are you actively engaging them with regards getting feedback on things like uh, low cost and uh, opportunities for improvements? I'm, I'm hearing that for some directors of public health, they, they may be on those calls, but in terms of the recommendations they're making and the suggestions, they're not always getting through to the front line. I was just interested whether that's something you recognise. So I, my door is open, my phone line's open, everyone in the country seems to have my mobile phone number, so they can call me any time. And I make sure I amplify their voice and uh, at the uh, board of Test and Trace, but equally ensure that we review all of their proposals that come through and try and find a way forward. Um, clearly, uh, I don't personally hold the press strings of local authority, but I'm very keen on ensuring that their voice is heard. So you absolutely commit to working with them moving forward uh, into any papers that they might submit, for example? Absolutely. Okay, brilliant. And, and Baroness Harding, just in terms of the, uh, the wider strategy with regards to using Test and Trace to help slow the virus, could you please give just an outline of, of what that strategy is going into the next a uh, few months, uh, in particular around how test and trace will help slow the virus. Absolutely, thank you for that. So I think there are, um, think of the, this as two main things that test and trace does as we go forward. The, the most important is finding people who have got the disease or are highly likely to be getting the disease and encouraging and supporting them to isolate. We are continuing to scale that testing and tracing and to speed it up, so to have more tests, to find a larger proportion of the people who've got the disease each day and to reach them faster. Um, then the second piece is to then be able to spot outbreaks early and support local teams to suppress outbreaks before that they gain any momentum. And that is through a combination of more engagement, as Susan has just referred to, working really closely with local health protection teams and Public Health England and local authorities, and also data analytics. So using the data that we now have from Test and Trace, but also from other sources like waste water analysis to spot outbreaks early and then support the directors of public health to reach out to their communities to stop it, stop it growing. Think of us as doing those two main things. And our short-term plan has four themes, more scale, more speed, more engagement, and leveraging more insight. That's the, the next phase of Test and Trace off the organisation that we've built in the last five months, which, as I say, is already the size of ASDA and growing. Thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you. And can I ask one final question? If very that's briefly. Okay, yeah. Just a short one. Oh, very brief. Um, just obviously with the announcement yesterday on, on the potential success of vaccines, do you foresee a point where the app will include an opportunity for you to say that you've been vaccinated and therefore would be either opted out from the, the test and trace system. I'm just very conscious that as the vaccinations go up, ideally the, the testing won't have quite as much pressure on it. I, I think that um, it's very early days and as the Prime Minister and um, Professor Van Tam said yesterday, we must all be careful not to get too excited and cross too many bridges on the vaccine. And sort of my job is to make sure that we 
scale and speed up test and trace so that it is another sort of quiver uh, another another arrow in the quiver as the prime minister said yesterday so i think we need it's an and not an or um, and you're right to point to one of the potential scenarios for the future is being able to use some combination of our understanding of immunity both natural and acquired um, together with testing data to enable people to do more things. But it's very early days. But are you preparing for that technical possibility now? Correct. We are. So you are doing the work to enable, as Dean says, as, the app to yeah. contain well, uh, information as to whether you've had a vaccine. You, as you've seen, with everything we've done over the last six months, we have always aimed to invest ahead of the science. That's why we're able to deploy lateral flow tests now, why we've got all the different sort of op options available as, to us today. So we're doing the technology logical work now in anticipation. Thank you very much. Zara Sultana, then Laura George. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got three questions directed to Baroness Harding. The first one is, in the test and trace system, out of the 35 organisations that are listed as data pr processors, only four are NHS bodies. Four are Lighthouse Labs, four are Public Health England bodies, and another is the Ministry of Defence. The remaining 22 are private companies, including Amazon, G4S, Deloitte and Serco. So with those numbers in mind, it's quite clearly an outsourced 12 billion pound program with a large number of private companies running testing sites, processing samples and managing call centers. So given those numbers, do you believe that it's accurate to refer to the system as NHS Test and Trace? Um, yes, I do. That is its name. Um, NHS Test and Trace is a free at the point of need um, service that we've built together, as you've rightly listed, with a whole group of different parts of society <coughs> to deliver something at extraordinary scale. But it absolutely meets our basic fundamental NHS values as a, as a clinical service available to everyone when they need it. Thank you. That's interesting, given that only four of the organisations are NHS bodies. My second question but Maybe is I could, could I possibly just clarify? Um, the NHS laboratories process testing data as part of NHS Test and Trace as well. They might not appear in your list of NHS data processes, but plainly the NHS tests are an integral part of our overall team of teams. Sorry. I guess my point is that the vast majority are not NHS, but my second question is, despite promising to abstain and stay neutral on the immigration bill due to your NHS roles, you voted in line with the Conservative Party on immigration and its impact on the social care sector. Do you think that this political partisanship will affect public confidence and compliance with the test and trace system, in particular reference to migrants and those with a precarious immigration status? Well, this, um, uh, this is a an appearance that Baroness Harding is making in terms of her official capacity, she's, um, she's welcome to answer that. Um, but I think it's a, it's a different sort of question as to uh, what her voting is in the House of Lords. Well, and I think I'm on the record in front of this committee when I was appointed as the Chair of NHS Improvement that I would not vote on health and social care matters in the Lords, but that I would vote on Brexit matters, and the voting question was a Brexit issue. Sorry. Thank you. And my final question is, um, SAGE advises that test and trace can only work effectively if at least 80% of close contacts are tracked and told to quarantine. Statistics for the end of October, the, the week end in October 28th, show, show that the system saw just 59.9% .9 of cases in England being reached. The figure was down from 60.6% from the previous week and only 60% in the week to October the 14th. And these have been the lowest since the system was launched. In September, as constituent MPs, we all had constituencies. I mean, um, I can only speak for myself, but I had constituents who got in touch um, after being told that they should drive to Inverness to get a test. And then there were cases of people having to wait for more than five days for results. And then in October, we saw the Excel technical glitch that led to nearly 16,000 positive cases for COVID-19 going unreported. So there have been calls for the test and trace system to be scrapped and the role to be handed to public health teams, most recently by Sir John Oldham from Imperial College London. And there have been calls by the GMB union for you to step down too. So given this catalogue of failures, should you be reconsidering your position? Well, um, thank you for that report card. If we set back and um, 
compare what we've delivered versus what we said we would at the end of July, we have met the vast majority of our commitments. So we committed to building testing capacity to half a million per day by the end of October. Testing capacity today is over 500,000 a day. We committed to making it possible for people to access testing across the whole country by having at least 500 testing sites. We have over 600 testing sites. So today people have to travel less than three miles to get access to a test. This is a service that didn't exist six months ago, and yet we've built a retail organisation, as I've said, larger than ASDA, and we've delivered on our commitments. That's not to say that we can't get better. Uh, clearly, we need to and can do as we continue to expand capacity and continue to improve on turnaround times and contact tracing rates. I would just say that we reached 81.2% of positive cases last week, and unlike other countries that have relied only on a local contact tracing system, we've been able to cope with a 17 times growth in volume over the, since the beginning of August. Um, whereas Germany, France, Spain have all been able, have been struggling, have had to suspend some of their contact tracing. So while you know, no one likes being able to describe how good or badly they've done a job, I personally always revert back to thinking I can do better. I think what the team from the public sector, the civil service, the military, the NHS and the private sector have done in the course of the last six months is an extraordinary thing. And it is making a real difference to the country. We need to do more, we will keep doing more, but I'm very proud of representing the people who've put all that work in. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and finally, Laura Short. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Baroness Harding. I wanted to pick up on a number of other committee members' questions around compliance. You said at the outset, Baroness Harding, to Jeremy, that evidence shows that people find it difficult to isolate. Can you give us further insight into the reasons and the evidence behind why people are not uh, quarantining and isolating as they should be? Yes, and, and as I said, I think one of the challenges with this is that it's all based on self-reporting evidence. So there are some quite competing different, different surveys, uh, a, a number of them in terms of the percentages. But the, the qualitative feedback that we've had is that it's not because people don't want to play their part, it's because it's hard. It's hard either practically um, to be able to have enough food to be able to isolate over the period of time, to be able to afford to do all that shopping up front. You, you know, for a lot of people, they can't do that. If they've got caring responsibilities for children or elderly relatives, how do they organize to do that? Um, the, the practical challenges are very difficult, but also the mental health challenges. Um, it is really hard to stay inside without contact with um, friends or family for up to 14 days if you're a, a contact. And so we re people report just wanting to have some fresh air. And that's why I say it's important we don't convince ourselves that you either completely comply or you don't comply at all. There is a big difference between someone who goes outside um, for 10 minutes at midnight just to have a quick walk on their own while wearing a face mask to get some fresh air from someone who chooses to go to a party even though they know they've tested positive. And we see much more of the former than we do of the latter. So uh, I think we have to work really hard and you know, local authorities across the country are doing just that to provide people with the support they need, both practical, financial and mental, um, to cope with what is a really tough thing to do. Proposed any policy changes on the basis of that evidence? Um, so the, 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 the main policy change over the course of the last few months has been the financial support payment. So £500 for people who are not able to work from home and on universal credit. You proposed that, did you, Bernard Sutton? No, sorry, I, I said Your that is the was, main change. Any policy uh, proposals that you've made? Um, certainly providing additional financial support is something that the Test and Trace team um, have presented evidence th for over the course of the last few months. Financial support to? To, to people finding it hard to isolate. Okay. Any other areas? Um, the other area is continuing to work with local authorities on making it easier for people to find the support offer that each local authority has. So we've done a lot to adapt our scripts and um, make it easier through calls and, and texts. And right at the beginning, when I started in May, 
Um, Tom Reardon and I worked very hard across government on setting out the, um, the, the local containment plans and the £300 million of funding that went with that to enable local authorities to build those support packages. So we have been a part of that jigsaw of government, local and national, um, working out how to support people through isolation. Lauren? Barry Sutton, you said um, monitoring compliance is difficult, and that's obviously true, but it's also equally critical in order to work out whether what we're doing is being effective or not. Um, what are your plans to increase the monitoring of compliance going forward and your strategy to make sure that that is effective? So a couple of things. So the support calls that we now make for people who are, monitor, who are in isolation gives us the opportunity to both monitor actual behaviour and understand responses. There is another area of data that is, uh, this is very early days, um, and again, un-QA'd, but an interesting avenue, which is when someone tests positive, they give us their contacts, we ask the contacts to isolate, a proportion of those contacts do go on to get the disease. And what we can see is that a very high percentage of those people who test positive whilst they're a contact only have household contacts, i.e. they have not gone out and mixed with non-household contacts, which again will give you a sense of how many of the contacts are actually complying with isolation. So it's early days for us to be able to share that data, but we have a growing set of, of, of sets of data that you can piece together to get a better picture of compliance with isolation. That makes sense. I do think there were a kind of comprehensive strategy on, on monitoring compliance would be helpful. But coming to my, my last question, um, Professor Sir John um, Bell said earlier that we need to get buy-in from the public and uh, propose a strategy of enablement, as he, as he called it. Now, uh, Dr Hopkins said that you're testing the efficacy of a number of uh, systems that he proposed, but overall, do you agree that we do need to move towards the strategy of enablement as uh, Professor John Bell described? Uh, well, I think that we must be science-led. So the work that Sir John and Susan are doing together is so important that what we do actually reflects the way the virus behaves. So well, I know we all want to be able to get out and do more things, but we must be led by the evidence. So I'd make that, that rider. I'm thinking of our testing strategy particularly in three forms of which enablement is one. It, we need to find the disease, we need to protect the most vulnerable, and we need to use testing technologies to enable people. It's not only enable, we need to do the other two as well. It's really important that we find um, the infectious people and stop and break the chains of, of transmission. It's also really important we use testing to protect the most vulnerable, the care home and NHS testing programmes, for example. But I do think that Sir John is right. There is a third testing um, opportunity, which is using it to enable more freedom as the science teaches us when we are less risky and therefore able to do more. You'll be bringing proposals on that um, front in due course. Indeed. Thank, Thank you very you. much indeed, uh, Laura. And just uh, finally, um, Dado Harding and Professor Hopkins, um, you've, you've seen, I'm sure, the, the SAGE uh, assessment that there's a 48 to 72 hour window uh, in which to complete the process uh, of uh, testing suspected cases of COVID to con uh, tracing their contacts and asking them to uh, isolate. Uh, if it's beyond 72 hours, uh, the assessment is that that increases R. Do you, do you recognise that? And as someone who's head of an organisation that brings together each part of that chain, what is the current performance uh, on uh, testing, tracing and asking people to isolate within 72 hours? Um, I recognise the sage advice, and maybe Susan would like to, to, to comment in, on it as well. There is one element that's a really important element of that 48 to 72 hours, which is the time from someone um, starting to feel ill to actually getting a test. And, it, and, and the reason why I can't give you a firm quantitative answer to your question, because that first piece 
I haven't, I don't, I haven't got quantitative evidence. So can you give it from someone first contacting NHS Test and Trace to request a test? Because they uh, I can't give you a complete end-to-end um, -end average at this stage. It is something that we are working to develop as we connect all of the different systems and as we scale. So I would like to be able to give you the one number, but I don't have it yet, I'm afraid. But isn't that the key measure? The, the, the whole point of the exercise, the whole point of your organisation is to bring the rate of infection down uh, and to curb the spread of the disease. Uh, your, there are your, a number of key measures. I think there are two, actually. There is one other, which is the number of people, the proportion of positive cases that we find that come into the system. Having something that is only fast but reaches a very, finds a very small proportion is clearly also not effective. So uh, we, we are working on, a, on improving both. So today we reach circa 45 to 50% of people who test positive. And I say circa because the ONS estimate is a central point with quite a large confidence interval. Um, and, and clearly we've got, got some work to do to get to the majority of people being tested and contacted within 72 hours. But we, we are reaching a, a meaningful proportion of that. If you look at the percentage of people who get a so test back within... What proportion do you think... Um, well, let me disaggregate it for you. I'll give you the two pieces. So... In terms of the proportion of people who get a test back within 48 hours, um, we, well, 46 point, um, sorry, let me give, give you this correctly. So 62% of people get their test back the next day if they come face to face, and 58% get the test back through our care home channel. So let's say roughly 60% are within 48 hours, and quite a proportion of them are better mm -hmm. for their test result. And circa between 70 and 80% of people are contacted within 24 hours of getting the test result right. The reason I don't want to combine the two is, is I can't track the individual through that to give you something that I know the UK Statistics Authority would be able to confirm is fair. So I still have to give you those two separate pieces. But we're not far off. If you say 72 hours is, is what really matters, mm -hmm. we're not far off contacting the vast majority of people through that journey. What would be world beating? Well, that's an interesting question because very few um, systems around the world publish as much as we do and have a... This is, comes back again, I'm sorry to be a broken record, of the national and local system. Um, the, the other countries are not able to publish this because if they have a solely local system, they don't have the national data. Um, we, we publish much more than any other system that we found. So we don't really have visibility of a um, other country's single figure in the way that you are pushing. I would, if I look at where is best practice, I look at individual components in it. I think we are, you know, we've built really the largest um, scale testing machine um, in, in modern times. And I think we can rightly say that we've, we are world class there. Other countries, such as Japan, we are copying the Japanese extended contact tracing system that enables you to reach back and find hotspots. We have copied from New Zealand the QR code system. So we're taking best practice from a number of different places. I don't think you can say that one country in the world has got this cracked. All of us are learning and we're learning from each other. Are we still, is world beating a, a realistic uh, aim? Is, is it possible to distill the best from each of those and be world beating? Look, I think that we should be aiming to have the very best test and trace system that we can possibly have as a country. And as I've said a number of times this morning, I, I'm incredibly proud of the teams across the country have delivered what we've got, but there's clearly more we've got to do. Thank you. And just um, finally, this is a lessons learned uh, inquiry. We, we're seeking to, to learn the lessons uh, of what's happened in a number of respects during the course of the pandemic, at uh, the beginning, uh, during the summer, and recently. And I think you've been good enough to, to witness some of the, the evidence that we've had today. Um, there, are some, there, there are some big questions uh, to guide, to learn from what we've learned so far, to guide some decisions in the future. And you have the privilege of being head of an organization that has a pretty broad reach. Uh, I think some of those questions are, whether we should be moving towards a more locally focused contact tracing uh, system um, relative to, to the national uh, system, uh, whether this question of compliance uh, with isolation uh, might be better observed if people were able to be 
confined for less time and mm -hmm. released if they're tested and found to be negative. Uh, and whether we can be better at anticipating uh, the, the, the future needs for surges in capacity such as we saw in September. Uh, in, in the spirit of trying to, to learn lessons that we can apply over the next uh, few uh, weeks and months, would you perhaps just reflect on uh, briefly on those three things, the, the local versus national in terms of contact tracing, mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the, the demands that we place uh, on people being isolated and our ability to anticipate uh, what's around the corner? Um, absolutely. So I, I think I've probably been quite clear. I think my view on contact tracing is that we need a mixed model of both local and national, um, physical, knocking on doors, but also on the telephone and digital. And you know, as we work together with local authorities, we continue to refine and improve that mixed model. Uh, I think we're going to need all, not either or, and it's a mistake to think of it as one or the other. Um, on isolation, I think there, the key is we have to be guided by the science. It is really hard to isolate for 14 days, particularly if you don't feel unwell, um, and it's making life really hard for you and your family and your loved ones. But we, we, we can't change it unless we can find um, scientifically valid ways of breaking the chains of transmission that are easier for us to live with. What's encouraging is the developments in testing technologies make that more possible than it was even six weeks ago. So you know, I would very much hope that the next time I'm giving evidence in front of the combined committee that the science has helped us unlock more of that and made it easier and more human for us to isolate in a way that, that works. Um, uh, but we don't know that yet. Um, in terms of anticipating, I, I think that uh, the, I would say there are two big challenges that we've learned in the last six months from this virus. The first is the amount of asymptomatic transmission. Um, and that has, it's taken us, you know, the world a long while to really understand that. And looking forward, the more that we can develop ways of working with the way we live our lives to find people who have the disease, the more it will be easier to see what is around the corner. Because if we can just see what's around the corner 14 days ahead, we can stop people infecting uh, uh, others. And, and I'd like, in the, looking around the corner, we've got a, a range of pilots ongoing, obviously, you know, the, the, the headline one being with the city of Liverpool for mass testing, but also with, with universities, with schools, with directors of public health. You, you would really hope that as we look forward, we will get better as a world in being able to stop outbreaks from spreading because we can find those asymptomatic transmitters earlier. And then I think the other area of looking around the corner is human behavior. You know, the, the, the temptation is, this is not just about um, clinical science, it's also about social science, about developing testing, tracing, isolation, and support mechanisms that work in our society, um, that we can actually live with. And I think over the course of the next few months, the new technologies and the scale test and trace service we've built will give us more tools to make that more livable for us all. Thank you. A member of the committee, uh, Luke Evans, uh, asked whether the, the structures that have been put in place will be retained for the long term to serve us in the event of future pandemics, such as we've learned countries in East Asia did. Is that part of your intention? Well, right now, my team and I are very heavily focused on the fight against COVID here and now. Um, but I do think it will be very important for the National Institute for Health Protection as it's formed, for the Department of Health and for the government as a whole, and the NHS as a whole, to reflect on how we build the infrastructure for the future. Um, and and I, I heard um, Professor Joe Martin describe it earlier. We have built a very large diagnostics industry, and I think it's really important that the country benefits from that infrastructure that's been built when we go beyond COVID, not just to make sure that we've got the surge capacity for other infectious diseases, but also so that we can use their laboratory capacity to, to treat other diseases going forward. Thank you very much indeed um, uh, to Dado Harding, to um, uh, Dr Susan Hopkins. We're very grateful for your evidence today uh, and we uh, recognise the, the very hard work that your staff do uh, up and down the country. Um, it's, these are difficult uh, decisions. Uh, I know that everyone has been uh, dedicated to making the, uh, the best 
uh, the situation that we have. Uh, your evidence today will allow us to make some reflections that are designed to, uh, to help to draw some lessons that have some application during the weeks uh, and months ahead. Uh, that concludes this meeting of the Joint Committee. Order, order.